Red is off. Green is on. Good. Keep it on. Turn that on. Yeah. Council, are we ready? We have microphones. Woo! Can you hear me? So be patient with us. We uh, might have some user error 
It might take us a little bit to get used to the fact that we have to turn our microphones on, but um, we're excited for uh, everyone in the audience and everyone listening in to be able to hear us. So, are we ready in the booth? We'll get started. Good evening and welcome to this regular workshop meeting of the City of Coppers Cove, Texas, held this 20th day of July, 2021. The time is 5.03 and this meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being conducted by telephone and live video streaming to limit face-to-face -face meetings in an effort to slow the spread of COVID-19 coronavirus. The phone number was posted on the agenda. All individuals listening on the call will be muted. Comments on agenda items submitted two hours prior to the meeting will be read at the time City Council considers the related agenda item. A recording of the telephonic meeting will be available upon written request. This meeting is also being broadcast live through Channel 10 and the City's YouTube channel. A link to the City's YouTube channel broadcast is posted on our Facebook page. Ms. Wilson, would you please call the roll? Mayor Diaz? Here. Joanne Cortland? Here. Fred Chavez? Here. Dan Yancey? Here. Jay Manning? Diane Campbell? Here. Vanya Hart? Here. Jack Smith? Here. Thank you. Next, we have announcements. None for me. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chavez? I have nothing, ma'am. Mr. Yancey? Nothing. Any announcements from here? Ms. Hart? None at this time. Mr. Smith? None. None. Mr. Howell? Uh, yes, ma'am. So uh, the city recently re released a uh, citizen engagement and priority study, um, and that'll allow us to receive feedback from our residents on a, uh, a wide uh, range of aspects of the community as well as city services. Um, the results will be utilized to help strengthen future planning and budgetary decisions. Instructions for completing the online survey are being distributed to residents through the city's monthly utility billing. Anyone wishing to complete a paper version of the survey may obtain a copy by contacting Kevin Keller, our public relations director, and residents are encouraged to take five to ten minutes to complete that survey. Uh, and the second item, uh, Mayor, is um, as you mentioned, uh, we're holding this meeting in a certain way regarding uh, the impacts of COVID-19. And just want to remind uh, both the council and our residents that COVID-19 is still around, it's still a communicable disease, many like, like many other communicable diseases. And just to remind uh, our, our city to um, uh, conduct and use proper hygiene, don't touch your face, and uh, just those necessary steps to uh, not only protect yourself, but the people around you. Thank you. Next, we have public recognition. Item one, Presidential Service Awards, recognition, Five Hills Royalty, Wendy Sled, Coppers Cove, Five Hills Pageant Director. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. It is great to be back in Council Chambers and presenting the Presidential Volunteer Service Award. As you know, our title holders were crowned at the end of March, culminating the city's birthday week, and they have been working hard on behalf of the city over the last quarter. So we're going to call each of them forward individually and tell you how many hours that they gained over the last three months as they promoted the city of Coppers Cove. I'd like to call forward our ambassador, Dawn Hale, is our Five Hills ambassador. You may remember her as our senior Miss Five Hills last year. Um, she also um, is a graduate of the Citizens Police Academy on the KCCB board, head of the Animal Control Board, and several other things. The list goes on. <laughs> and then also our Five Hills Junior Ambassador, Maddox Tobias. They will be presenting the awards for us today. Our first title holder that we will honor tonight is our baby Miss Five Hills, Blakely Fight. Blakely has 52 hours of service, um, and you might say, what can a baby do? But let me tell you, she came in, uh, won her heat at the diaper derby, um, and represented the city of Coppers Cove with her banner on. Um, she also has done all kinds of um, fundraisers for us. She'll be at Stuff the Bus in a couple of weeks, and you can bet that she will be bringing in all of the donations. Um, Blakely has a total of 52 hours of service over the last quarter. And she's also a military kid. Her father's active duty at Fort Hood, so we thank this family for their service. Our next title holder is baby Mr. Five Hills, Orion Douglas.
Orion has 25 hours of service, and his platform is the Hope Pregnancy Center. Orion has already done several clothing drives and several supply drives for things like formula and donated those to the Hope Pregnancy Center. Perfect job for him. He knows how to pack things up and organize and disorganize and things like that. So. <laughs> Our tiny Miss Five Hills, um, we had to PCS to Germany, so we recently replaced her with our first runner-up, which was Beth Grant, and she is very involved already. She was crowned on the 26th of June, but that was not too long ago, and so she is already accruing her hours, but is not qualified for an award yet, but she's already doing a great job on behalf of the city. Our next title holder is Tiny Mr. Five Hills, Aaron Correa. Aaron has 25 hours of service in this first quarter. Um, one of the things he's really been diligent about is providing bottled water um, for our fire departments around the area. So that's one of the things he loves to do. He wants to be a firefighter when he grows up. Our manager, Miss Five Hills, Halen Hendricks, is actually on vacation in Georgia. They're a military family, and he is on block leave, and so that's where they are. But Halen's platform of service is cultural diversity, and she has accrued 98 hours of service in the first quarter. Our next title holder that we're recognizing is miniature Mr. Five Hills, Edward Sanchez. Edward has 30 and a half hours of volunteer service for the first quarter, and his platform of service is Valentine's for Veterans, so we're already gearing up for that, and he'll make that delivery right around Valentine's Day at the VA Medical Center. And he's also a military kid, and his mother is in the audience today. She's the one taking pictures back there. But she just retired last Wednesday after more than 20 years at Fort Hood in the U.S. Army. So thank you to this family for their service. Our next title holder that we're recognizing is our Little Miss Five Hills, Braylon Lyles. Braylon has 154 and a half hours of service in the first quarter. She's been working on behalf of children in foster care through her platform of service, Fostering Hope. She hosted a lemonade day and she took advantage of every opportunity. Not only did she raise money to buy suitcases for the kids when they are taken out of their homes, because usually their stuff, if they have anything at all, leaves in a garbage bag. But she also used that opportunity to collect more than 1,500 items to put in those suitcases for those kids. So great job, Braylon. Our little Mr. Five Hills, Swayze Gray, is on vacation um, because it is July. But his platform of service is Ronald McDonald House. You may have seen him recently in the newspapers with all of the pop tabs that he's collected off of aluminum cans. So please be saving those for us. Um, but he has 108 uh, eight and a half hours of service for the first quarter. Our next title holder to recognize is our junior Miss Five Hills, Desiah Gilbert. Desiah has 125.5 hours of service this year. She'll be hosting her junior homecoming dance. It'll be our fourth year for this event um, on September the 17th. And all of the money she raises is going to go to help support that dog park that we want in Copper's Cove. So you may remember Desiah. Um, she was a little bit not as tall as what she is now, but she is our former Little Miss. So... Our next title holder to recognize is Junior Mr. Five Hills, Nathan Garner. Okay. 
Nathan's platform of service is Keep Copper Go Beautiful. And you might have seen some pictures that Kevin Keller captured where he was creating his artwork just outside of this building for a national sidewalk chalk day as we worked all over the city to do that. But Nathan has 56 hours mainly cleaning up our community. So great job, Nathan. Our next title holder to recognize is preteen Miss Five Hills, Doriana Gilbert. Doriana has 127 and a half hours of service this year. Um, her platform of service is anti-bullying, and you may have already seen on the Chamber website where we are going to be painting the town orange in October. Not literally, but figuratively, as we ask you to decorate all of the city buildings and your businesses in orange to show that we don't tolerate bullying in Copper's Cove. So great job, Desiah. <laughs> Our next title holder that we'll be recognizing is Young Miss Five Hills, Emily Kimball. Emily has 160 and a half hours of service, and her platform of service this year is Alzheimer's Awareness on behalf of her grandmother, who's in memory care. You may recognize Emily. Um, she hosted Bingo at Rabbit Fest to raise money for her cause if you came out and played with us. Um, we'll be doing the Alzheimer's Walk, and then she will be hosting the Little Miss Chris Kendall pageant this year to benefit her charity. Our next title holder that we'll be recognizing is our team, Miss Five Hills, Angelica Torres. Angelica has 90 and a half hours as of the end of June. Her platform of service is the American Heart Association. I will be doing, of course, the American Heart Walk, but Angelica will be hosting a recycled Go Red for Women fashion show at the Spring Fling coming up in February. So look for us all in red and all in 100% recycled materials. Our um, Miss Five Hills, Karina Dominguez, unfortunately she is a veterinary technician and she is still at the vet hospital right now. So, But just so you know, we're working with um, the animal shelter. We actually have a meeting next Wednesday where she can start working with them to get more animals adopted out um, at locations throughout Copper's Cove. But Karina is an amazing representative with 101 hours of service as of the end of June. We're now going to recognize our ambassadors. You may remember this young man as our miniature Mr. Five Hills last year. Did an amazing job. Um, he ascended up to the crown. The um, uh, winner was not able to complete his reign, and so Maddox stepped in late in the year. Still managed to do over 300 hours of service last year, even getting a four-month late start. And this year, he is already off and running. He has more than 171 hours of service this year since being crowned the junior ambassador at the end of March. And all of those free little libraries you see at Copper Scope Schools and the city swimming pools, those are maintained by Maddox, and he does an amazing job. Finally, our Five Hills Ambassador, Don Hale, we're recognizing tonight. Don works full-time as a supervisor at a local hospital, yet she has managed, in addition to all of her other duties that you heard me rattle off and I didn't hit them all, um, she has managed to represent her title and the city of Copper's Cove with 152 hours of service in the last quarter. Her platform of service is senior citizens, and she works diligently on their behalf. We did a Mother's Day tea um, at one of the nursing homes. We also did a Father's Day ice cream social 1950s style uh, we have a fan drive coming up so all kinds of things Dawn is there so terrific job Dawn
so I don't know if you've been adding this on your phones, <laughs> but that is more than a thousand hours of service that they have contributed to the city on just the first quarter alone. So look out here. We're going to keep pushing COVID further and further away, and we plan to do another 5,000 hours again, which is our tradition. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Thank you. Once again, on behalf of the City Council, we thank each and every one of you for your contribution to the citizens of Copper's Cove. Ms. Led, was that everyone? Did everyone make it in from yes, traffic? Yes, okay. ma'am. Thank you. Perfect. So we'll move on to workshop items. We give everyone a chance to leave. Thank you, everyone. Move on to item one, presentation and discussion on routeware fleet automation. Larry Scott, Director of Solid Waste. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. It's actually, uh, obviously I'm not Larry, but Larry Scott's here in the audience tonight and he's, he's really taken a lot of effort to pull this together tonight, working with uh, route wear. Um, wanted to just introduce what we're looking at tonight. I appreciate you all taking the time to um, uh, take the time to hear this presentation. Route wear, the, the first time I was acquainted with route wear was when I worked in Colleen and we rolled out this system for our solid waste crew over there. Um, almost immediately I saw increases in efficiency and decrease in, in costs and also an increase in customer satisfaction. So we wanted to bring this to you, walk you through what the software is, and this is this is uh, an add-on to the solid existing solid waste crew functionality, um, not taking away from it or outsourcing in any way, shape, or form. This supplements basically our troops, gives them the ability to do their job smarter, more efficiently, and also provide that transparency for our customers uh, relating to their, their solid waste services that they receive from the city. Uh, tonight I have Eric Langner, he's the Regional Sales Manager for Routeware. He's going to take you through this presentation. Uh, also have Mr. Larry Scott, Director of Solid Waste here. Uh, so if we get down into some specific questions, Larry can assist there. I also have Mr. Watson and Mr. Turner in the back if we need to go even further. Uh, otherwise I'll be here to make something up for you. So with that I'll, I'll bring up Eric and he'll go through the presentation and we'll go from there. Very good. Well, um, first of all, thank you guys for having me, Mayor, City Council folks. I tell you that little Maddox is going to be a tough act to follow. He uh, he had a smile, man. I, I couldn't believe it. But that's great. Um, at any rate, yeah. I mean, purpose of the of the meeting here for us is to kind of walk you through Routeware, uh, what it what it is, what it does, a little bit of history on the the company itself. Um, so I'll just go ahead and jump in. Um, and by the way, please feel free to interrupt with questions. It's not going to interrupt my flow at all, um, just as we get through this. And, you know, we're, we're basically going to just give, like I said, a little bit of background on the company, um, a little bit of diving into some of the ways that um, cities like yourself get, get benefit from this in terms of just their return on investment with the, uh, with the application, uh, and then talk to some of the things that it actually does, and then we can follow up at the end with any kind of summation and, and questions. So, um, Routeware Global actually has been around for about 20 years. Uh, it is at this point a family of companies. Not only do we have the Routeware platform itself, uh, we also offer other uh, services. We've acquired a few companies over the last you know, five, six years. Uh, we do route optimization. We do uh, the onboard computers, which is mostly what you guys are looking at here. Um, we have billing platforms. There's a whole bunch of things. We have a, most recently we acquired a company called Recollect, which helps uh, cities communicate with their citizens in terms of you know what they pick up is and, and you know what's recyclable, what's not. Uh, so uh, the reason I'm bringing all this up is just to say you know if 
as you guys grow and continue to mature as a city, you know, there's lots of things we could help you with in the future. So it's not, it, it's future proof um, your investment with us and make sure you don't get, you know, painted into a corner or something to that effect when it comes to, you know, technology and, and you know, just advancing. So, um, and with regard just to, you know, the, some of the ways that, that we help, I mean, again, you know, there's route optimization, routing, you know, making sure that you pick up every single can on every single street is a lot more complex than it initially sounds when you think about the thousands of houses that have to be serviced you know every uh, every week and what happens if just you know one or two streets get missed it's usually not very pretty from a customer service standpoint um, so you know we certainly help with all that at the heart of what we do it is that kind of onboard computer with the tablet and the truck and then we've got the you know the back office functionality as well so that you know, folks like Larry can have complete visibility into what's happening in real time out on the out on the road. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit um, in terms of, you know, some of the screens and some of the things that you're able to see from the back office, because that's really at the heart of, of what we do. Um, and so the, the, the computer itself that we put, the tablet that goes into the device or the device that goes into the truck, you know, I mean, I've been in the software business for probably 15 plus years, and usually, you know, when you're in the software business, you're dealing with lines of code and, you know, computers and people sitting at stations a lot like you guys are sitting in front of here. You know, one of the unique things about Fleet, and I think solid waste in particular, is the fact that we are dealing with a... You know, a truck that is out, you know, there's vibrations, there's, you know, motion. And so we're dealing with a lot of hardware. And it's actually, I think, one of our things that, that we do really well and is sort of our, you know, secret sauce, if you were, is putting these, um, you know, these computers and really an entire sort of network into a vehicle so that you can have not only the onboard computer, but you can understand when a an automated side loader is lifting up a, um, a garbage can. You're going to be able to have photos. And, you know, if you, on your front loaders, you can, you know, see how much things weigh. There's a whole bunch of things that these onboard computers are capable of. Um, but certainly the thing that most cities get the immediate benefit out of is just the visibility into where is the truck, where is it on the route, and is it actually doing the service that it's supposed to be doing and having the ability to verify that that's happening? And that's, I mean, the ability to have that in real time is so important when you talk about, you know, a citizen calling in and saying, you know, hey, you know, you didn't pick up and then being able to have that conversation with them with proof that you were out there. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute in a little more detail. But this is what the driver sees, you know, when he's in his truck, he's got a map. Um, there's the ability to see turn by turn directions. I think, you know, at this stage, a lot of us just from our, you know, consumer experience <laughs> are so used to being able to get those turn by turn directions. I know, you know, when I, when I grew up, I, you had to have those maps and flip around and now we're all, I'm so dependent on Google myself. Um, but this is, you know, for the driver, you know, if you have new drivers, you know, as you guys continue to grow as a city or have turnover, um, as you bring in new drivers, being able to just put them into a truck and have them, you know, understand the route and be able to service every single address on that route uh, through the through the computer is, you know, it, it's a it's a huge savings in terms of just time and efficiency and making sure that they get the route done correctly the, the first time. So. Um, you know, we can jump into questions, or like I said, or if you guys have any questions about how this works in the truck, feel free to ask them. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a big part of what we do. These photos here are pretty typical of what you'll see. So oftentimes, um, I mean, we can put cameras all around a vehicle, but the most common place is that service side where you have the, you know, the arm that's picking up the can and so what you're seeing here are pictures you know on the left you know you can see they've got you know an overstuffed container um, on the right the picture on the right you know there's the containers not out uh, but what you have here which is nice is the ability to say you know this is when we did this service this this is exactly where we were at the time and so when you when you get someone calling in and these by the way get transmitted in real time I mean within you know, 30, 60 seconds of when these pictures are taken, they're able to view them in, uh, 
in the back office part of it, Routeware Control Center. So if a, someone calls in, even five or ten minutes after the truck has driven by, and they say, hey, you just drove by my house and my, my cart was out, the, the agent on the other end is going to be able to say, well, you know, we can email you the picture with the time and the date stamp that shows that the cart actually wasn't out. Um, and then in terms of extras and, and things where somebody maybe has, you know, extra bags out or things that, you know, you can have the extra charge on, um, you know, the way that it happens with a lot of cities, and I, I believe the way you guys currently do it is if a driver sees that, they can take out their personal cell phone and, and snap a picture. But oftentimes, you know, that won't happen. Uh, and with us, I mean, literally, if they just hit a button, it's automatically going to snap a picture um, on any of the skips. It just does that automatically. And so being able to capture that much more regularly and being able to take billable events from those photos uh, is a way that you guys can plug revenue leaks, capture additional revenue, and you know, get that return on the investment um, that, you know, that people are looking for when they, you know, when they invest in a, a, a solution like ours. Um, we do work uh, with, I mean, I think there's 10, 10 plus at least cities in, in Texas that currently use Routeware, uh, Killeen, Temple, uh, Waco all use it. Uh, you know, there's a city of Edinburgh, um, Harlingen, Corpus Christi. Uh, they're all using um, Routeware to, you know, help build efficiency within their solid waste collection operations uh, and, you know, get, get those benefits that we were, you know, we were, we were talking about. Um, and this kind of just getting back to sort of the, you know, the ROI, you know, the revenue leakage is one thing, but then just the efficiency. Um, so like an example might be uh, a truck breaks down halfway through the route and they've still got, you know, 250 stops left to do. Uh, you know, it, with, with route wear, you're able to literally draw a, you know, a polygon on a map around different neighborhoods and just with the click of a button, assign those out to a different driver. That automatically goes directly to the tablet that's right there in the vehicle with a little notification that says, hey, you've got extra stops. Um, that would take hours of time and just, you know, headache for someone to try and do that from the back office with, you know, radios or phone calls. Uh, and paper routing, so the ability to, to, you know, automatically send out helper routes and things like that, um, hugely beneficial. Again, if you've got, you know, new drivers coming on board, the ability to have them, you know, have those, um, you know, those routes automatically in the vehicle when they start, uh, hugely beneficial. You know, certainly we see, uh, you know, the ability to, to coach drivers and to see how they're running their route. I mean, you can look at a driver and see were they at speeding at any point during the day. Um, you know, you can see, you know, went from, uh, from when they, you know, stopped, had to go to the transfer station to do a drop off, come back. So there's lots of ways that you can get visibility into what drivers are doing to help coach them along and, and make sure that they're you know, doing things that are safe and efficient and, and you know, maximizing, you know, the, the use of, com of, of city resources. Um, oh, man, I think I went the wrong, oh, there we go. And this, you know, so we do a lot of these ROI analyses for, you know, cities, even private haulers. Um, you know, some of the numbers that are in here come from just what we see as sort of industry norms. I did get some background from Larry, certainly, in terms of your specific operation, uh, some of the charges that you guys do for uh, extras, um, you know, certainly there's a lot of, you know, ability to kind of plug those, you know, those revenue holes, especially when you're talking about, you know, the current method of, hey, the only way that we can really validate that this person had this out was if, you know, a driver takes out their personal cell phone. The ability to, to have that automated and you know immediately come back to headquarters and then get a report on those at the end of the day, that can go into you know your other billing systems, um, is a way for you guys to really capture quite a bit of additional revenue. Um, reduction in go backs is another way that we see people really capturing um, savings and you know for most cities and this is a little bit of an industry norm but it costs roughly a hundred dollars an hour. 
uh, to run a you know solid waste vehicle when you take into account all the costs. And so the ability to reduce go backs uh, is a significant savings. And if you can have someone, you know, if they call in and say, hey, you know, you missed me, and then you can show them just immediately by emailing a photograph that you were there, that really reduces callbacks. And it also just helps with customer service agents having like a, you know, a he, sh a he said, she said kind of moment. Um, and we, we see that as a, a really big contributor to the return on investment um, with our application. And then, of course, just the, the general efficiency when it comes to things like, you know, the helper routes, being able to get a new driver up to speed quickly, you know, being able to just get visibility into, you know, what routes are running, you know, the most efficiently. Um, all of that really contributes quite a bit to the return on investment. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have any questions on, on how we came up with those numbers or... Councilman Campbell. Thank you. I, I do have a couple of questions. Yeah, for you. Uh, the numbers are extremely impressive. And so I just want to make sure I understand where these numbers are coming from. If these are based on, I understand in general, it's yep. based on conversations with staff. But in specific, when you talk about the uh, additional revenue contributions, $88,000, do we actually look at numbers of uh, where there was overflows or whatever and find out what those numbers actually are or very close estimates? Or is this more in general for based on other cities in your company? Um, no, I've got specific with. numbers from Larry on this with regard to like the number of routes you guys run a day, what you guys currently charge, and then the current method mm -hmm. for you know validating that, and mm -hmm. then what we can expect as an improvement. I mean, look. But were they validated with our numbers? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, we average 10 to 15 go backs a day that you know we can't answer because. Mr. Scott, can you please approach the podium and speak? Is that what we're averaging, 10 to 15 a day? That we know of, 10 to 15 that actually people call in and say we have not been at their address or service them. So then we have no proof, so we go back and service that address. Okay. And uh, the $100 an hour average, to send, is that based on our numbers, our actual cost, or is that... That is, that's industry. a number that we've provided based off of analysis that we've done okay. uh, that looks at, you know, sort of an industry average of what it costs to run a solid waste vehicle. And uh, Larry, so. do we know, is it close to what our actual numbers are? I can't say that right now, ma'am. I'd have to run the numbers myself. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was just looking, wanting to, I mean, the numbers are huge. So I just want to make sure that they have been validated by staff that these are pretty close to what we could realize in savings. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And the other question I had as far as the, um, uh, that, it, did I understand you to say, or just help me understand, uh, it's taking pictures constantly, or he, they manually have to remember to push a button to take pictures of an overflowing trash can or a missed that uh, driveway that did not have trash cans yeah. on site. So it's not taking pictures constantly 100% of the time, no. Uh -huh. um, there are certain automations that do happen. So on a skip in particular, there is an automated picture workflow that happens on a skip. And then if they see an overflow, they can trigger one as well. Um, Automatically? No. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they press a button on the... On okay, the, so it does require manual intervention. Okay. It does require a little bit of manual intervention, yeah, absolutely. Especially, you know, when you talk about something that's an outlier, um, you know, it's not just going to take a picture on every single house that they're going, you know, through. So, yeah, it does require a manual intervention. But it is a, you know, I mean, because we've been around doing this for 20 years, the software has gotten to a point where it's very intuitive for a driver to be able to do this in real time while they're driving their route. All the route data is loaded in ahead of time. It's all corresponded to addresses. And because you know exactly where the vehicle is, mm -hmm. you know what address that's corresponding to. And so it, it, it does do it. Um, you know, a lot of it's automated, but it does require that one physical interaction from the driver to say, hey, yes, there was an extra here or there was a skip here. And then it takes that, that picture. Thank you. Yeah. 
Mr. Yancey. Um, uh, Larry, on, yes, sir. you have had experience with this in Scott. Both of you had experience with yes, this sir. in Colleen. So my question would be, you know, based on the questions that Diane was asking, how do these compare with numbers in Colleen? Because you you've actually experienced though you know this in action and how how has that been a savings to that city just i ran the commercial side which is pretty huge huge and clean we ran day and night shift 24 hours uh, i had seven routes a day uh we have when we first started up it was around ten twelve thousand dollars that we were bringing in every quarter once we streamlined and we got the routes right I was up to almost fifty thousand dollars a month on go backs, extra overages, just and I did the system for four years, and the ability that it gives us is, is phenomenal. The options that we have, and the drivers, and we can custom take custom tailor this product to what we need. Our uh, fee charges, uh, everything, everything can be custom tailored just to us to what we want to charge for uh, anything that would benefit the city or us. It's the total transparency that has drawn me to it because first I was against it because mm -hmm. I was used to the paper routes and doing it our way, people watching us, but it won me over. And uh, I really enjoyed the product. I actually worked with Temple, Waco, Corpus Christi, and some of the other cities when they wanted to move into it and go, you know, from Colleen. And uh, it, it's a product that really works. So. And if I may. Mr. Uh, Smith, do, uh, go ahead. Just, just to add on um, to the, the numbers, uh, from my seat, and I wasn't living it every day like Mr. Scott was, you know, in terms of functionality, the numbers that I'm seeing are, are numbers that appeared to be uh, being realized through the budgetary process as far as the increases in revenue, more efficiency. Uh, other benefits came into play, quite frankly, like uh, a couple instances we would have a citizen, uh, you know, issue a concern about a, uh, a truck speeding through their area. This is all geofence. We can tell exactly how fast they're going. There was another instance when there was a wreck, uh, and it was claimed that you know our driver had been speeding, had you know basically uh, ran through a stop sign. Turned out, based on the information we had from route where we were able to basically challenge that that assertion. So there's there's other components that come into this, but just to address your question, the numbers uh, based on, on my experience, uh, they really reflect reality. Yes, they are based on, you know, uh, national industry standards. There are some other individual city specific numbers that have been played into this ROI. Yeah. Thank you. I want to follow up to Diane's question, and she asked about uh, do you have to automatically push a button, or does it, you said it automatically takes a skip picture, but how does it know, I mean, does it know the route so well that every time it's supposed to stop somewhere, well, or do you have to, I mean, is that another manual? So if you look, and I realize it might be a little hard and, to see and, this, but th this is what the driver is going to have. Yes. You know, sitting in front of them in the vehicle, the big red button is skip. If you oh, um, oh like that's this. that's the screen they have. That's okay. the screen they have. Okay. And one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Th I mean, this is the probably one the most common one that they see. But yeah, there you can have a couple. Are different you talking this thing that that just tells us what fork sensors and scale integration is? Oh, you're talking about the smaller screen. Yeah, that just that see. little okay. the little kind of okay. tablet. I'm seeing that. <laughs> the red button. Okay. The big Go red ahead. button on the little tablet icon. So that's what the driver is going to see. And when they go, uh, you know, they're at a stop, the cart's not out, uh, they can hit the skip button. That automatically, you know, takes logs it in the system. It correlates it to that address and it takes a photo with the timestamp and the location. Okay. 
So that, that's how that works. And then, you know, if there is a, um, an extra, you know, they can certainly add that from this, this same screen as well. There's a little events button down or extras button down at the bottom. It Sounds basically good. does the same thing. Ms. Hart. Uh, yeah. Um, how long does it keep information? Um, really just for, for as long as you have the, the system. I mean, you, you can go back, you know, years. Oh, okay. So, yeah. One more question, Mr. Mr. Madam Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, as far as uh, streamlining and consolidating routes is concerned, when you were in Colleen, Mr. Scott, what, yes, how sir. much did that save you as far as time, manpower, and dollars, roughly? When you pulled up on the screen like this, I had three monitors, and I'd pull up three or four, three different routes, and you could see all the dots and all the locations, and I would blow them up and look and see which which routes were crossing during the day and stuff like that, which routes were more separated, it took longer to do. And then I would move, I could literally move from one stop to another, to another route to make them more efficient. Mm -hmm. You know, I could actually see where they're at, say, okay, he shouldn't be crossing each other all day long. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't, when I'm driving my front loader or side loader, I shouldn't see another truck unless I'm going to the dump. Or going down the highway back and forth. So we're talking savings and efficiencies involving manpower, fuel, yes, sir. wear and tear on the truck, that kind of thing. Yes, sir. This is one of the reasons I'm a big proponent of this, is that I think that we need to do the most that we can to get the most out of the equipment, the vehicles, and the people that we have. And by providing them with a tool like this that is quite literally cutting edge and really helps us uh, give the most service and transparent service to our customers, uh, I see it as a big win, so I'm a big proponent. Any other questions at this point? He still has uh, I, I have one presentation. More. Yes. Yeah, and then I'll wait for the rest of it. But I, we have bulk pickup here. Is there any way to put a little button on there so the driver can say they need bulk pickup at this address? Well, what the driver can do is if they drive by and they see there's an issue out there, yeah. they can stop and take a picture and, and send a message to us in the office, not only for uh, like move, they see a move out or a large pile, if a can's damaged or anything, or you see something that's broken like a gate where you gotta go to pick up, you wanna let somebody know, so take a picture of it. You sit there, type your message in, and it'll go to us so we're aware of it and we can talk to that tenant before anything gets out. Yeah, and a lot of those things can be kind of preloaded in. Like you can preload in a bunch of like drop down options, but then somebody could actually, if there's something unique or a little out of the scope, they could actually type in uh, their specific concern with that location. Are we good? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just going to fast forward back through. Um, you know, this gets a little bit more into just the ROI just over time. Um, you know, based off of the numbers that we had and, you know, just the analysis we talked about, I mean, you know, it would be less than a year before you broke even on this. And, you know, the savings get, you know, greater over time. Um, and, you know, if, if you guys need additional validation, happy to provide that. But, you know, I did plug all the numbers into our ROI calculator myself and, you know, it's not unusual to have, you know, I mean, of the cities we do work with, you know, they're pretty happy with our, our system. I mean, we really have very few, if any, failed implementations where people are like, this isn't working for us. You know, we have been doing this for 20 years with municipalities just like yourselves. And, you know, we have a really high success rate. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's because the system works, um, the hardware, you know, functions in this environment. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time and energy getting the software and the workflows right so that, you know, those, you know, extras and skips and things are as automated as they can be, but not to the point where the system is, you know, going haywire and thinking for itself. Um, so at any rate, um, you know, I'm going to jump in a little bit to the particular um, proposal that we put together for you guys. So, you know, we have the, the onboard computers themselves. Uh, there's the cameras, the proximity sensors, um, which allow uh, the proc sensors, which allow us to know exactly when a uh, the vehicle is picking up a can, and that 
Again, that's an event within our system that gets captured with a location and a time and date stamp. Um, and that's all uh, going to be on the truck. We do all of our own installations. So we are the one hand to shake throughout all of this. So you're not going to be having somebody that's like, oh, well, they didn't do this right or they didn't do that right. We even provide the cell service, the cellular data service. So we're going to be you know, the one you know, person that you can go to when something isn't working, which inevitably, you know, any complex system is going to have some problem at, at some point. Um, but, you know, we certainly stand behind everything we do from a service standpoint. Um, and, you know, because we are kind of that, that one hand to shake uh, with everything from end to end, we provide the hardware, the installation, the training. Um, and, you know, because we've had the level of, you know, doing this for 20 years on the level of expertise, we've gotten quite good at that. Um, so that's what's in the, the proposal. The upfront investment is roughly $45,000, and that essentially represents the hardware and the installation uh, going into this. And then there is an ongoing monthly charge, which is the 4,206 number down there. Um, I'm just going to flip to the next. There we go. Yep. So um, total first year, uh, when you add... You know, basically, you take that you know forty two hundred and change and multiply it by twelve. It works out to the fifty thousand. Add all those together with the upfront cost, and so first year is ninety three thousand, and then on an ongoing basis, it's roughly that fifty thousand uh, a year that would be uh, the go forward number. And then you know, roughly every you know five ish years, there's typically going to be like a hardware refresh where you might need new tablets that just you know they do get old over time, and um, so. But that's, uh, you know, that's the proposal that is currently um, on the, the table with you guys right now. Yeah, um, Scandal. Uh, what, I have one more question. What is the term of the contract for how long? Our standard term is three years. Um, but, you know, some cities, you know, it's not like a hard and fast thing, but our standard term is, is three years. But we can do an annual contract if that's, you know, a lot of cities don't want to go beyond the annual. So there's flexibility there. And we'll be able to track as staff whether or not we're realizing the savings. Great. Thank you. Mr. Yancey. Did I remember on the slide back that the uh, break even was 140 days? Did I? Did I see that? I think that's what, yeah, and I think it's 140 business days. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just taking, you know, again, that ROI number and multiplying, you know, looking at the investment and just putting and do we into it. Do we know how many trucks we're talking about? 12, Tuesday, 14, Wednesday, 12, Thursday, 12, Friday, 12, Saturday, 12, Sunday, 12, Monday, 12, Tuesday, 12, Wednesday, 12, Thursday, 12, Friday, 12, Wednesday, 12, Thursday, 12, and then 6 on Friday to cover so all the services. 14 it's, trucks. Yes, sir. But that proposal was only 10 cameras. Is that right? Yes, sir. Some, some trucks don't require the outside camera, like the uh, brush trucks and bulk trucks. You can actually take that tablet out and snap a picture with it when they want to get the correct dimensions and stuff like that for charge piles. So they don't need that additional camera. Okay. So we're talking the regular dump trucks, the, Front side, loader. the side trucks, the side loaders, the commercial overhead loaders, yes, sir. and the bolt uh, brush. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Any other questions of council or uh, from council? No? Yeah, and this just kind of gets to some of the benefits that different people within the organization will see. I mean, you know, drivers uh, oftentimes will like it because it gives them visibility into where they need to go. They make sure they don't, you know, miss anything. You know, obviously, you know, folks in, you know, Larry's position like to have that visibility into where all their drivers are if they need to do reassign and so forth. Um, you know, the, the call center people that, you know, take the calls when somebody feels like they, you know, they missed something, you know, they like being able to just say, hey, this is what happened, and it kind of ends, 
you know, back and forth discussions. Um, you know, safety, uh, another thing that, you know, a lot of people, I mean, kind of like um, what Scott was talking about with, uh, you know, people saying, hey, you know, your truck was in the neighborhood speeding and you have the ability to, you know, validate whether or not that that was true. If it is true, I mean, you can have certainly a conversation with, with the driver and give them coaching. Um, you know, it's uh, pretty hands-off from an IT, uh, you know, it's all cloud-based, uh, so pretty hands-off from an IT perspective. Uh, and then, of course, just, you know, executives like to see the, the savings and being able to capture that additional revenue and, and you know, have, have the efficiency of the operation. So everyone hopefully gets a little something out of, out of the, the system. Um, and this, you know, finally just, you know, kind of gets back to just us as an organization. Um, you know, uh, we are, I would say, you know, definitely the industry leader when it comes to municipal solid waste hauling. Uh, you know, we've been doing it for 20 years. We have a lot of experience doing this particular thing. There are other companies out there that certainly do fleet management and things like that. But we are really specialized with solid waste in particular, and we work with a lot of cities just like you guys, and we really provide a lot of benefit. Um, I mean, I was just out visiting with some of your, you know, other, uh, you know, sister cities here in Texas, uh, up in Waco and Colleen and Temple, and, you know, having the same conversation with people that are using the system and finding out and hearing about their issues. And they were all, you know, not to say that there's never any trouble or any hiccups, but they all love the system and get a ton of value out of it. And they, you know, we had in one of those cities, we had an issue with, you know, some of the cameras um, that came about as a result of their, uh, their fleet management team making a, a, you know, a small error in, in terms of an installation. And they feel like it sent them back to the stone ages, not having that ability to have those cameras and, and capture that, you know, capture those, uh, those events as they're happening on, on the routes. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that level of kind of reliability is, is the, I think, the secret sauce of what we do because, you know, putting these, you know, these systems in these vehicles is not a simple task. Uh, and there's really no one else out there that has the level of experience that, that we have. And it, you know, ends up driving a lot of value. Um, and because of, you know, a lot of the way that, um, that we work with cities, you know, you're really kind of future-proofed because we do have these other options. You know, we have APIs. If you ever want to integrate in with some of your other systems, um, that's certainly all things that we can do. It's not part of this particular proposal, but it is something that is available, you know, on a go-forward basis. If you guys got down the road and you're like, gosh, we'd love to, you know, integrate in with whatever, you know, billing or some other system, that those types of things are possible. So there's definitely a certain amount of, of future-proofing there. And then, you know, just kind of uh, to wrap up, you know, uh, our reputation, I think if you, you know, follow up with any of the existing folks that are using it, you know, um, you'll find that, you know, we have a very solid reputation in the industry. We've been doing it for 20 years. Um, you know, you have complete support, whether it's, you know, calling, emailing. Um, you know, we do a, an annual uh, user conference. We're typically at a lot of the other conferences as well. Um, and, you know, we're, we are, thing is based here locally in the United States. We're at, the company's actually based in Portland. I'm based here in Texas down in the Houston area. Um, and so, I, like I said, I mean, I cover Texas for, for the company. And that's pretty much it. I mean, I can take any other questions that have, that have come up, but that's the, that's the presentation. Council, we have any other questions? Great presentation. Scott, do you have anything else to wrap up? No, ma'am. Just uh, thank you all for taking the time to listen, listen to this and go through it. We really appreciate your support. Absolutely. Yeah. Great presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. There being no other business on this workshop, um, we'll take a 10-minute break before we start our regular meeting. The time is 5.57. I'll adjourn this meeting.
Is everybody ready? Let's get this started. Good evening and welcome to the city council, this regular city council meeting for the city of Coppers Cove held this 20th day of July, 2021. The time is 612 and this meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being conducted by telephone and live video streaming to limit face-to-face -face meetings in an effort to slow the spread of COVID-19 coronavirus. The phone number was posted on the agenda. All individuals listening on the call will be muted. Comments on agenda items submitted two hours prior to the meeting will be read at the time City Council considers the related agenda item. A recording of the telephonic meeting will be available upon written request. This meeting is also being broadcast live through Channel 10 and the City's YouTube channel. A link to the City's YouTube channel broadcast is posted on our Facebook page. Please rise for invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Wilson, will you please call the roll? Mayor Diaz? Here. Joanne Cortland? Here. Fred Chavez? Here. Dan Yancey? Here. Jay Manning? Diane Campbell? Here. Vanya Hart? Here. Jack Smith? Here. Thank you. Next we have announcements. Ms. Cortland? None right now. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chavez? I have nothing, ma'am. Nothing. None. None. Mr. Smith? None. Mr. Haverlaw? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> thank you. Um, first, I want to say uh, thank you to our IT uh, team for installing our new technology uh, with our microphones and speakers and uh, our, our uh, recording so uh, system. Um, it uh, has already proven just from our workshop, uh, from uh, responses of those watching uh, remotely, that it is tremendously improved. So th thank you. Uh, next, um, we are, uh, have launched our um, citizen engagement and priority study. Uh, that study will allow us to uh, receive feedback from our residents um, on uh, varying aspects of uh, the community as well as city services. Um, those results will be utilized to help strengthen future planning and budgetary decisions. Uh, instructions for completing the online survey are being distributed to residents through the city's monthly utility billing. Uh, everyone wishing to complete a paper version of the survey may obtain a copy by contacting Kevin Keller, our public relations director, and residents are encouraged to take five to ten minutes to complete that survey. Uh, and the last item is um, we have been receiving uh, reports on um, the status of COVID-19 in our region uh, and just want to remind uh, council as well as our residents that it's a communicable disease just like many other communicable diseases. Um, and to practice good hygiene, wash your hands before touching your face or just don't touch your face. Um, and also, uh, if you are feeling ill, to uh, seek medical uh, attention or, and stay at home. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Citizens Forum. At this time, citizens will be allowed to speak for a length of time not to exceed five minutes per person on any item which is listed on the agenda and items not listed on the agenda. 30 minutes total has been allotted for this section. Pursuant to section 551.042 of the Texas Open Meetings Act, any deliberation or decision about the subject of inquiry which is not listed on the agenda shall be limited to a proposal to place the subject on the agenda for a subsequent meeting. At this time, if there's anyone in the audience that wishes to speak during Citizens Forum, please approach the podium and state your name and address for the record.
Good evening, City Council, staff, and citizens of Copperas Cove. My name is Tamara Gast. I reside at 1308 Cardinal Trail. Regarding action item H5 on tonight's agenda, I have applied for the position of planning and zoning as my first choice to serve our community. I submitted an application on Tuesday, May 18, 2021 to the City Secretary's Office via email prior to the initial submittal deadline of May 24th. My experience or no special knowledge to this position is previous employment with the, city of with the city as a development liaison for almost three years in the planning division of the Development Services Department. I am familiar with the 2020 Comprehensive Plan and have often navigated through the amended Chapter 17.5 subdivisions, Chapter 20 Zoning, Chapter 4 Building, the Public Works Infrastructure Design and Construction Manual, and the State Basic Sign Regulations. I've also dabbled in Chapter 11 Municipal Utilities and Services, Fire Department Appendix D, Fire Apparatus Access Roads. I have over 10 years extensive plan review experience and almost three years plat review experience. Over 30 years residential, commercial, and uh, construction experience. I have a current Certificate of Open Meetings Act issued on October 22nd, 2020. 18 years total service on various executive boards as a volunteer following the Robert Rules of Order. To completely fill out the city council appointed advisory body application, I listed Board of Adjustment as a secondary choice. Please note the last Board of Adjustment was held on October 10, 2019. I feel my experience and special knowledge may be better served with the Planning and Zoning Commission. I look forward to volunteering and serving for the City of Coppers Cove and understand the commitments listed in the appointment qualifications and term of office under Section 20-15. Council, I wish to thank you in advance for considering my application for the planning and zoning position. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak during Citizens Forum? Please state your name and address for the record. Everybody hear me okay? I'm Ed Hathaway and I live at uh, 804 Industrial Avenue here in Cobbers Cove. Um, first of all, I noticed the city was out mowing and weeding the cemetery on Thursday. So I want to thank whoever was responsible for that. However, I'm uh, of the opinion that that only came to pass because there was a lot of heat on social media started by me concerning how disarrayed the cemetery is. I'm grateful nonetheless that y'all were out there, but at the same time, I, I, I don't think you have to be a history buff you know, to enjoy cemeteries. That's a place of, of calmness and reflection for a lot of people. I don't have a dog in this fight, really, because I don't have any relatives buried out there. But it bothers me a great deal when I go out there to clean up somebody's grave um, and tombstones are covered. I counted five Vietnam vets whose plaque I couldn't even see. My dad was a Vietnam vet. This town is chock full of military, and I think it's a great disservice. A person doesn't have to have been in the military, or the police department, or any other service industry. That's somebody's life. You know, that's a history lesson. Somebody's life is there. It's living history. You know, it, it, perhaps if we spent more time, you know, checking in on tombstones and keeping it clean, you know, I don't know that the world would be a better place. That's a stretch, but I know I would keep from being pissed off, so you could just help me out if you don't have any other, uh, any other reason for doing it. There's a lot of people that chimed in on social media l week before last, uh, and to, to, I've only been back in Cove two years. To my understanding, this has been an ongoing problem. I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what I was told. I, I, I really don't like to speak uh, regarding people's opinions, but. So I don't really don't I really don't think you know I, I don't know what y'all are gonna discuss I don't I can't really stay here I've got family from Japan and they're leaving in the morning, but I I do want to say one thing, I have no problem with volunteering and all that, but I really think that it's a city's responsibility to take care of its cemetery. I don't think there needs to be a volunteer group to rely on because then you know then you've got human personalities involved and that could go awry. It's the city should do it. Plain and simple. You know, people pay to be buried there. So, you know, 
gas is going up, but I'm a lawns for a living. You know, if, if you guys, you know, don't want to do it, give me the gas and I'll do it myself because I got some spare time. I just, I just think it, it, it should be done by the city. Did I come in under five minutes? You did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to speak during Citizens Forum? Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Conrad Dio Carissa. Good evening to everybody in here. I live in 901 Kelso Drive here in Copras Cove. I'm so concerned about my neighbor across the street, and I thank Miss uh, whatever her name is. <laughs> she entertained my problem. This problem has been going on for so long. This guy owns a shop, mechanic. I have about six cars every day on my side, and my wife cannot back up because we cannot see the car coming from the other side, and we cannot do well, you cannot have two cars with it. He has too many cars in there. Yesterday, he was yelling profanity, and my ears is not a garbage, you know. He said he was in the army, he's got PTSD, I, I don't care, I'm a counselor for the VA. And when I drive, I, when I drove back, I was driving going out um, creek. He hosed my car with the water and flipped his finger. You know, I ignore, I'm too old for that. So I talked to Miss Brandy Rodriguez many times and they have been monitored. Floyd came one time last week. It was documented. He always parks. I don't mind if he can park his car so that he is he's not fixing on his side. He parks right there at the corner of Kelso, then my driveway, corner of my driveway, and it's a difficult, and I'm getting so much stress. Yeah, I'm leaving for Washington State in two weeks, and my wife, being a Filipina, she said, I'm really scared <laughs> what the heck is going on in here. So if somebody can look on that, I went to the police department and have it blotted yesterday, the incident. Yesterday, this morning again, he started yelling. Every, I don't like to get out on my driveway because if he's outside, he built his own canopy. He said, no, because the, the wife said that he knows a lot of people here. I don't know. He's like influential person. So I said, that's fine. I just want to bring this concern to you guys if we can do something. As I said, I don't mind if he takes too many cars, but put it on your side. I know it's a public property, I know that. He can say, but yesterday, there was no cars in his side. There were six cars on my side. He deliberately does it. I don't know what's going on, so please look into that. Yes, yes sir. sir. Excuse me, sir, could you repeat your address? 901 Kelso. Used to be chief was my neighbor. Oh, okay, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate for that concern, you know. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak during Citizens Forum? Is there anyone listening on the call that wishes to speak during Citizens Forum? Please press star nine or raise your hand to be recognized. Mayor, no one on the call has raised their hand. There's no one else that wishes to be, speak during Citizens Forum. I'll close Citizens Forum and move on to consent agenda. All matters listed under this item are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. There will not be separate discussion of these items. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Council, does anyone wish to remove an item? Hearing none, I'll read the items. Item one, consideration and action on approval of City Council special workshop meeting minutes for July. <clears throat> July 1st, 2021, Lisa Wilson, City Secretary. Item 2, consideration and action on approval of City Council workshop meeting minutes for July 6, 2021, Ashley Osborne, Deputy City Secretary. Item 3, consideration and action on approval of City Council regular meeting minutes for July 6, 2021, Lisa Wilson, City Secretary. Item four, consideration and action on resolution number 2021-17, accept, accepting the quarterly investment report as presented for the quarter ending June 30th, 2021, per the investment policy. Stephanie Potvin, staff accountant three. 
Item 5, Consideration and Action on Resolution 2021-18, authorizing the Chief of Police to donate used body armor to the Coryell County Sheriff's Office, Gabriel Cardona, Police Captain. Item 6, Consideration and Action on Declaring Personal Property of the City as Surplus Property and authorizing the City Manager to dis dispose of miscellaneous Fire Department equipment, Michael Newyar, Fire Chief. Item 7, Consideration and Action on Resolution Number 2021-19, authorizing and supporting the City Manager in the submission of a grant application and other related mandatory documents to the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance, Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant, FY 2021 Local Solicitation Program, Lester Nace, Police Captain. Council, what is your desire? Madam Mayor? Yes. I'd like to make a motion we approve consent agenda items F1 through 7 as presented. Second. second. I have a motion by Mr. Yancey, a second by Mr. Chavez. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. At this time, we are going to move our reports from staff outside entities, advisory committees, and boards um, up in the agenda. And we have item one, cemetery operations report. Jeff Stoddard, Director of Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, so I'm glad Mr. Hathaway is here uh, to hear this. Um, since I've been with the Parks and Rec Department, it's just under two years now. We've had uh, two times uh, in that two years we had a serious rash of complaints about the city cemetery. Um, both of those time frames coincide with the loss of the part-time employee at the cemetery. So when this happens, when we lose that part-time employee, the uh, responsibility to mow and, and maintain the cemetery falls on the mow crew. Now, the Mo crew currently takes care of eight parks, nine municipal buildings, and four open areas in the city, city uh, uh, limits. Um, this add addition to the cemetery to the Mo crew means that the cemetery would be addressed about every 12 to 14 days. Um, and of course, with the rain that we've had, it grows quite quickly. So how are we going to address this? Well, currently we have um, a a staff member that we just brought on as a full-time member and working with the park superintendent his uh, idea and um, request to me was to move a full-time employee to the cemetery and then the part-time over to the mo crew and after a lengthy discussion with uh, uh, mr neely i agree that that's probably the most efficient way to handle the cemetery and keep the mo crew on 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 track so we're, we're currently, uh, last week, he, the new employee was being trained up on equipment with the Mo crew. He is currently working in the cemetery as of this week. I definitely think that we'll see a lot of improvement uh, since we never received, or I shouldn't say never, we received very few complaints when we had the part-time employee work in the cemetery. So this will move it from 20 hours a week to you know 40 hours a week if necessary. So I really do think we'll see some improvement in the cemetery moving forward. Um, I handed out a map section. Can how do we pull that up here? All the way on the bottom. Yeah. All right. The big one. Oh. So this uh, that first page you have is just basically the overhead uh, footprint of the cemetery. And we're going to be focusing on the two middle sections of the cemetery. And on the copies I gave you, I outlined a black area on that front page. And it has some importance moving forward. The second page is the middle section of the, new, um, of the newer portion of the cemetery. Now, to give you some type of idea of the uh, work involved in that, the the headstones are placed on a cement footer, and you can see them in the overhead. They run from basically street to street across there, and that is approximately 6,520 linear feet of edging that needs to be done. That's just the edging. Now, we can move the mowers through the sections, but there's still uh, 6,500 linear feet to be edged, and that equates to 1.2 miles. That's just one section, okay? And if you move to the third page, um, and you know, look at your first page and your, uh, and your third page. 
that bottom area, or I should say the right area that's in black on your first page, I had the uh, maintenance staff go out with a wheel measure and measure the curbing in that section. And that curbing measured out to be uh, 37, 47 linear feet. Now, it's curbing, so you got to weed eat on both sides of it. So if you double that, it comes out to 7,494 feet, which is 1.4 miles. That's just in that small section. There's three other sections like that in the old where there's a lot of curbing. And in these areas, we can't bring a Z, uh, a Z track in, zero turn or anything like that. It, most of these sections have to be um, weed eated completely. And if you go back to your first page, below the, the section that I, that I outlined for you, that middle section, staff went out last week and weed eated the section as you first enter the cemetery to the right. It took two people two complete days to weed eat that section. And like I said, it's, it's not an area that's easy to get access to a mower. Currently our staff does not have push mowers. We're looking at, at possibly uh, looking into that as far as to ex, uh, expedite this process, but currently the entire old section is, is done all by weed eating. And subject to that, um, the only th other thing I have is, is later this year, the council approved funding for a cemetery master plan. And this master plan will not only address future expansion of the cemetery, but existing issues in our current footprint that we're looking at right now. Um, no one on my staff has an has a incredible amount of experience in cemetery um, as far as the overall uh, pitfalls from it. And I'm hoping that this master plan and the advice that we receive from whatever firm we choose will, will point us in the right direction on how to right some of the things that we have wrong right now. And I'll answer any questions you might have. Council, we have any questions? Jeff? Nope. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, with that, we'll move back to our regular agenda on to public hearings and action. A governmental body shall allow each member of the public who desires to address the body regarding an item on an agenda for an open meeting of the body to address the body regarding the item at the meeting before or during the body's consideration of the item. G1, public hearing on proposed amendments to the city's home rule charter. Ryan Haverlaw, city manager. Thank you, Mayor Diaz. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, Last year, the City Council provided direction and then eventually established a uh, Home Rule Charter uh, Review Committee. Um, there were uh, a total of seven individuals uh, that City Council appointed, uh, as well as two um, City Council members. And I just want to read their names uh, because I think it's important with the work that they did. Uh, was uh, very beneficial to uh, our city, you as council, because the recommendation comes to you. And then eventually uh, those recommendations, if approved by this council, will uh, go to the ballot. So uh, those individuals were uh, Larry Letzer Jr., George McMaster, Cheryl Merid Meredith, Danny Palmer, Sylvia Rhodes, Bo Rodan, Sandro Rve, and city council members that were uh, on the committee are uh, council member Fred Chavez and council member Diane Campbell. Uh, the committee met over uh, the period from uh, July through uh, December and uh, very efficient meetings. Uh, they conducted themselves uh, in a manner that uh, created um, dialogue to uh, hear out the concerns that each of them had. Uh, our, I want to say thank you to our city attorney for participating uh, during those meetings because uh, Mr. Zek provided expert guidance and advice. Uh, to the committee, especially as it relates to state law and, and what state law says about uh, city charters, especially our city charter in particular. Um, and I also want to say thank you to uh, Mr. Kevin Keller and uh, Lisa Wilson um, for their support. Uh, they actually were the catalyst to uh, move the committee forward quickly once council appointed uh, the committee members um, and uh, continue their activity uh, so that it wouldn't stall out. Um, they completed uh, their task in December and based on the city charter, uh, there's actually a timeline that the council must follow once those proposals are brought to council. And so that's why those are being brought to council uh, in July at this time. 
the chair of the committee was uh, Council Member Fred Chavez. So, uh, Council Member Chavez, thank you for chairing that committee. The vice chair was Sylvia Rhodes. Sylvia, thank you for uh, taking up the slack where uh, uh, Mr. Chavez, uh, when he wasn't able to be at those meetings and guide the rest of the committee. And so I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Rhodes. Uh, she was selected by the committee to present uh, the uh, charter amendments to council. And we have uh, Mr. Zek uh, on our uh, meeting call as well, who can answer very specific, hard questions that the council may have as it relates to the charter language and state law, um, uh, how it relates to state law as well. So, Ms. Rhodes. Thank you very much, City Manager. Good evening, Council and May Madam Mayor. Okay, um, I just want to review very briefly, hopefully you've already had a chance to look at the amendments um, to the different measures. So I would like to go through Measure A, first of all. And in this measure, it deals with the qualifications for office and the changes that we made, which there were quite a few, but they are just to coincide with state law and bring this, this measure up to uh, state law requirements. So, Sylvia, I, I want to <clears throat> excuse us, stop right there. If we have questions on each measure, do you want us to ask the question or you want it to get through all of the measures and then go back? You can ask me as you think of them. I think that yeah, would I, be best, I, right? I think as we're going through these, if yeah. council has questions, let's ask it on, on that item. So, I've already gotten a clarification and, and understand now why why this is, but I think it's important to, to point it out because I didn't I didn't actually know this was um, law. But um, in the revision, it's um, line through be a qualified voter in the city of Coppers Cove, and it's changed to be registered to vote. Um, so can you explain or have Mr. Haverlaw explain the difference between just being qualified and, and actually being registered to, to, yeah. to be a qualified individual to run for uh, office. Mayor, I'll, I'll be happy to, excuse me, I'll be happy to explain that and Mr. Zek can, can supplement this, but um, an individual can be a uh, individual who's qualified to vote, but just because somebody is qualified to vote doesn't mean they have registered to vote. So people who have registered not only qualify, but they've taken the step to submit their registration uh, to actually vote in a uh, election called by the governing body. And so, and so it's my understanding that state law says not only do you have to be qualified, you also have to be registered to vote in order to run for an office. Yes, and I'll uh, defer to Mr. Zek uh, to affirm that. Yeah, well, the, it, to be qualified to vote, you have, there have, there's two steps. You have, to, you have to have lived in the area the appropriate amount of time, and you have to be registered. So it's those two things that make you qualified. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of drill down on that. I found that interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. I think that's a good question. Any other questions for Measure A? Okay, so then Measure B deals with the compensation for the council members and the mayor. And um, the board felt that uh, there should be an increase from the $50 for the mayor we um, recommend or suggested that it would be increased to $75 and for the council members going from $25 to $50 per meeting for each regular and specialty meeting attended. That is the biggest change on that. Does the council have any questions on that? Okay. Then measure C. Measure C deals with the hearing, hearings on forfeiture of office, and it clarifies requirements for holding a hearing um, when it's regarding alleged violations. So I did have a clarification on this one as well. 
So um, it states, I guess that's the, in the middle of there, maybe the second, third sentence where it says, the hearing shall be held within 30 days of, of the council as a body learning of the alleged forfeiture. Wouldn't that be violation once they learn of the violation? Because at that point, it's not a forfeiture. Or is it automatically? Because you, you, you took out forfeiture up top. Because, because you're, you're saying it's not immediately a forfeiture. So I was just thinking. Yeah, it sounds like. So I was thinking that that word should not be forfeiture at that point. I mean, forfeiture matches, in my opinion, the rest of the paragraph. But I was just thinking forfeiture wasn't appropriate at that point. Should that be alleged violation then? That's what I was thinking. That was my two cents. But I, I would like Charlie's opinion. I think either is, 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 um, is fine. Uh, if you believe it provides clarity, you could certainly change the word forfeiture to violation. Well, no, I mean, does everyone agree that it's not a forfeiture at that point. I think you should say violation. Violation. That, that's the way I understand it. Well, I think it's a, it's a matter of semantics. Um, a, if you did violate the charter, you have forfeited your office. And so right. um, whether we use the term forfeiture or violation, I, I really don't have a legal issue with one way or the other. I don't think it has a substantive effect on the outcome. But if you believe it brings clarity to the it or is better written that way by using the word violation instead of forfeiture I have no issue with it well then what was the reasoning for taking forfeiture up at the top taking it out well we could have just as easily written if a council member is to have, is is alleged to have forfeited their office it just wasn't done that way again you know for consistency and clarity change the word forfeiture to violation completely okay with that, but I'm also okay legally, leaving it the way it is. It's completely up to you. Okay. I mean, I won't throw myself on a sword over it. I was just... <laughs> I, I totally understand from, from where you're coming from on that. Yeah, if you feel more comfortable with... If, uh, for clarity's sake, if, if we feel more comfortable using violation and then it's not going to hurt anything to change it, and that's fine. Yeah. Okay. And we couldn't we even leave in forfeits his slash her office? No, I don't want to no. change that. Okay. I mean, I was just thinking. I mean, if that's. Okay. I mean, I can leave. They it. didn't affect. It, it, if it'll make things easier, I'll I'll go ahead and recommend we change the word forfeiture to violation. I mean, it certainly is more consistent with the way it was um, amended. Okay. It's a simple change to make it. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay, then measure D. Measure D, um, there were just a lot of revisions and some deletions of unnecessary wording for clarity. Any questions on this one? Mm -hmm. I don't have any. Yay. Okay. Measure E. Measure E. Um, this just in the changes no, we no. made. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mr. Smith. I do. I, it, I mean, on section 2.09, it says we scratched out all meetings shall be open to the public except as otherwise provided by law. Are we going to say they should all be open to the public or, I mean, I, I believe all meetings should continue to be open to the public. All meetings are required to be open to the public except as required by the Texas Open Meetings Act. And all this does is simply is make that consistent with the law. We're not changing the fact that all open, all meetings have to be open. Okay. I would 
just comment, um, Jack, when we were going through this. Yeah, that, I wasn't there, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, it, it was just a matter of making everything consistent with the state law and taking language out that's not necessary because it's already covered under state law. And so okay. you'll see a lot of that. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's not necessary to state it because it's state law. Yeah. Okay, was I on F then, I think? Was I on F or E? I'm sorry. Lost my... F? Yeah. E? No questions on E? E. Sorry. Lost my place. Okay, so the changes under Measure E were to ensure compliance with state law. So we, we just removed a lot of unnecessary, redundant, because it's already state law that requires us to do it a certain way to handle the ballots. Okay. Mayor and Council. Yes. Uh, I, I do want to point out one uh, bit of this, and that is in Section 3.04 of this measure, uh, where it states at the very end of that that um, subscribing and take it to their oath of office at a time and in the manner as required by state law and then striking out the second regular city council meeting after the election. Um, there, one of the reasons that was brought up is there has been uh, some uh, question as to uh, the legality of requiring it to be the second regular meeting and what if that person's not available the second regular meeting or what if the meeting for some reason got canceled you know, are they no longer eligible to serve in their seat? And so uh, Mr. Zek uh, made this change, which uh, one, creates uh, flexibility, but also allows a candidate as soon as uh, the election is canvassed to be able to take office. Okay, moving on to measure F. Measure F require, is uh, regarding the petition signature requirements. And uh, we, one of the changes we made was that it requires either the date of birth or voter registration, not both, when a, someone signs a petition. Any questions on this measure? Okay. Then measure G. Uh, here we just made a lot of revisions, some revisions and deletions for correctness. So on this one, if I could, um, I did want to point out that 2.07 is in Measure C, and it's also reflected in Measure G. And at first I thought that was a mistake, but it was pointed out that the revisions made in Measure C were different than revisions made in Measure G to 2.07. And so we just want, want to be mindful of that. In Measure um, C in 2.07, you're changing the content, where in Measure G in 2.07, you're just changing the adding a she to the he, she. So it's just grammar. Right. So some people might pick up on that, that 2.07 is in there in two different measures. And it's supposed to be because it's two different ways of changing 2.07. Did I say that right, Mr. Harrell? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Then Measure H, pertaining to city manager authorized absences. Um, and we just uh, added that I know it's always done like this, Ryan explained, it's always done like this anyway, um, but that his absences are approved by the council. For the meeting, sorry. Yep. Okay. And Measure I. Measure I deals with the capital improvement plan, and um, we changed in here that it's reviewed annually by the council, striking every five years. Any questions on this? Council? 
and J and K, oh, J and K are, we changed the same thing just pertaining to the capital outlay plan that it's reviewed annually, and then K for the personal plan oh. that it's reviewed annually. I think I'll jump one ahead, sorry. Any questions on I, J, or K? Okay, then measure L deals with the cosigner. And we changed in here because there is no uh, assistant director of finance, that it would be the director of budget that would cosign the checks. Any questions? Okay, and then the last measure, measure M, is uh, the pertaining to public officials and employee complying with state law. The changes brings the measure to comply with state law. Any questions on measure M? Okay, I think that's it then, right? Yes. Right? Mayor, yes. Um, I also wanted to uh, talk with council about the potential for another uh, amendment to the charter. This one recently came up, um, and that is in section 2.02. .02. So uh, I'll give you just a second to uh, go to 2.02, .02. and it's actually uh, section two is council, and 2.02 um, .02 .02 is restrictions. And uh, in the first sentence, in the second line, uh, it states that he, she must resign and vacate his, her present office at least 60 days prior to the next election of the desired office. So essentially what this is saying is that if a council member chooses to run for another office, there are two offices, council member and mayor. So if a council member chooses to run as a sitting council member for the mayor office, as an example, that council member is required based on our charter to not only resign as soon as they decide to run and submit their uh, election packet um, from their position, but that they must also vacate their position. Um, our uh, city secretary, Lisa Wilson, uh, investigated this a little bit with the secretary of state's office and the Texas Constitution actually states that it is true that they do resign once they submit their packet. However, they are held over in that position until that position is filled uh, by uh, through the next election or appointment based on the requirements of our charter. So we actually talked with our city attorney, Charlie Zeck, um, about the conflicting information we had based on the charter versus the Texas Constitution. And Mr. Zeck stated that the uh, Texas Constitution does supersede the charter in that area. So um, if a council member does file for another office, which is the mayor, the office of mayor, that council, council member, member resigns once they file for to run for that office, but they are held over in that position based on the Texas Constitution. And so uh, with, with that being stated, uh, wanted to ensure that uh, council would agree with asking uh, Mr. Zek to prepare a ballot measure to change section 2.02 .02 so it is consistent with the Texas Constitution. And Mr. Zek, is, is that accurate? And I uh, wanted to see if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, it's, it's accurate. I, I would just agree that it's inconsistent with the Constitution in the sense that it does require a resignation, and that's not inconsistent with the Constitution. The Constitution simply says that in the case of a resignation or a vacancy in office, subject to very, very limited um, exceptions, the office holder is obligated to hold over in their office until such time as their successor is appointed or, or otherwise is elected to office and takes office. So it's not. I don't think it's accurate to say it's inconsistent with the Constitution. The Constitution just says, hey, if, if you vacate your office, you are obligated to, to continue to perform those functions until your successor takes office. 
in Marion Council, I, I would just let you know that historically there have been, uh, that there's been that situation and the council member um, had been instructed and complied with actually stepping out of their seat and did not participate as a council member any longer at that point, did not vote, did not attend meetings as a council member. And so I, I think it would be helpful to actually clarify that. Um, and, and I totally understand Mr. Zek's uh, position on that, but the word vacate uh, apparently has been interpreted that you can no longer perform your duties as a council member in the past. Madam Mayor. Yes. I think that uh, I think it's something we should go ahead and have Mr. Zek uh, write something up for and, and so we can change that to make it more consistent with with the uh, Constitution or at least to clarify it so that we're not doing the wrong thing yes have consensus um, so mr. Uh, um, uh, mr. Haberlaw was suggesting that we revise it so they I think he was suggesting that we revise this it's not a vacated seat uh, this suggestion is that we clarify it to make clear that um, you can perform their duties so um, I'm happy to draft anything uh, at the direction of the council but we just need better direction I know you didn't vote on that suggestion but I, when we do vote to make a decision I'd like some clarity on whether or not we are going to revise this so that the seat is not vacated at the time that um, um, they announce or within 60 days I think is what it says Ronnie if I'm not mistaken that's great um, or if they or if they continue to keep their seat. There, there are, are some, some there are some, some practical, practical consequences, consequences with how that's drafted. So for example, um, um, I guess maybe not, because if they run for another position, well, if they run for another position and they're not required to vacate their seat and they lose, they still keep their seat where they were, where, where they had originally been. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Currently, you if run for another seat on council. If you're a council member and you run for mayor, as an example, you you vacate your seat, which means even if you lose the election for mayor, you lose your council seat. If we draft it so that they don't vacate their seat, if you run as for mayor as a member of council and you lose, you get to keep your council seat. So there are, that is a very typical difference between the outcomes. I'm sorry, I, I, I have to, I just for clarity, uh, if you do not, uh, you can't run for two positions simultaneously, is that correct? Mayor, that's correct. But, that, but that's not what this is. This is but a situation no, where you, you're holding a seat and you decide to run for another one. I'm just suggesting for you know clarity for discussion whatever that if you choose to run for mayor and you resign but you don't vacate your seat if you're not running for that position then and someone else runs for that position then they would have assumed that seat and I think it goes without saying but I, I got a little cloudy when Charlie was speaking but well, what he was saying is if you don't immediately call for that other election mm -hmm then that person, if they lose the election for mayor, then he is still in his seat, or that person is still in his seat. Unless you have called for the election to replace that council person, then he is still in his seat. He hasn't vacated. And in actuality, he should resign his seat because he lost the election. So where is that where you need to call that other election to have to replace the seat he should have resigned from. So how does that, those semantics work? Right. Madam Mayor. Yes. I, I think we needed to read somewhere where that he holds over and continues serving until he's replaced. Whether he wins the, the election as mayor or, but if he, if he loses the election as mayor and someone else is elected to replace him in place three, they take over. Well, we need to talk generalities here. Okay. Well, let's say anyone. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. But well, until a special in, election can be until called a special election can be called for a replacement. So the answer, so we need to find the question is, do we want an interpretation 
for Mr. Zek to provide an interpretation as the language reads, or do, are we asking for new language to put into the amendments for November? Madam Mayor. Yes. Fred Chavez. Uh, I would say that we're asking for new language that would would say that if an individual is going to, uh, that is a sitting councilman and is going to run for mayor, that when they drop their paperwork to file, that that would they would be required to vacate, however, would be held over in their position until uh, until the until the a special election is held. And we couldn't we, if I'm not mistaken, the special election could be run concurrently with the general election. Am I out of bounds here, Charlie? Is that enough direction? No, but the, it, it, it just, I was just double checking the charter and, um, and we have, th we have three year terms. We have another, we may have another issue here um, that I didn't recognize when I first got the email and had the conversation with Brian. It, it, it dawned on me that we have three year terms for our council, not two year terms. Yes. Um, and under, under the Texas constitution, there's something called resign to run. And if you announce for a candidacy for another office, um, and there's a year and 30 days remaining on your, um, on your current term, then this is an automatic resignation from office. But you would still continue to hold over in that office until your successor is appointed and qualified. I believe under that, under that section as well. But if it's longer than 30 days? If longer than one year and 30 days. So if there's, if you have at least one year and 30 days remaining on your term, it's considered an automatic resignation. So if, in the, if you're in the first year, you announce for, to run for another position, that would be an automatic resignation. And Mr. Zeck, that, that is consistent with uh, our discussion that we had with you previously. Okay, good, all right. I couldn't remember if it was or not. I apologize. <laughs> so now I'm confused. So now there's time limits on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. One year and 30 days. So, Mayor and Council, um, in section, uh, let me get to it, 2.07. Subsection C, filling of vacancies. Um, that's uh, part of uh, what uh, Mr. Zek is talking about in terms of uh, filling those vacancies. Part of it, because what Mr. Zek is actually talking about is what is in the Texas Constitution specifically, being that uh, one, one year and 30 days, uh, correct, Mr. Zek? Yes, sir. And so uh, the section in our charter really just uh, talks about how those vacancies are filled filled once those vacancies are created. Um, what Mr. Zek is talking about is the time limit in when in which a, an existing sitting council member elects to run for another office, uh, what is the automatic resignation time period? So uh, I, I guess, guess to help move this along, uh, Mayor and Council, it, we, we have an opinion from Mr. Zek uh, regarding our charter language and the Texas Constitution, and we will follow uh, that guidance uh, that Mr. Zek has provided, which means we don't have to change the city charter. Uh, my, my concern is historically the way the city charter has been interpreted when a council member chose to run for another office, uh, not only were they told, but then they did. Um, uh, I don't want to use the word vacate because Mr. Zek has said that vacate is basically resigning. Uh, they they uh, no longer participated as a council member. And, and I, I'm, what my thoughts are is it needs to be clear that the, that individual can still participate as a council member as a holdover, um, but they do resign, automatically resign their position. 
we don't have to then. Just to clarify, Mr. Havilar, we don't have to then change the charter with that interpretation being in place by our city attorney? Uh, and, and based on what Mr. Zek said, that is accurate. I'm, I'm fine with the clarification. Okay, with that being said, um, this is a public hearing, so uh, Mayor, if you'll uh, call for the uh, okay. public hearing and we can take public comment. Okay, item one, public hearing on proposed amendments to the city's home rule charter. The time is 7.08, I'll open this public hearing. If there's anyone who wishes to speak on this item, please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. If you're on the call, you can raise your hand or press star nine to be recognized. Again, if there's anyone that wishes to speak on this item, please press star nine or raise your hand if you're on the call or approach the podium. State your name and address for the record. Mayor, no one has raised their hand on the call. Appears to be no one that wishes to speak on this item. The time is 7.08. I'll close the public hearing. Move on to H, action items. H1, consideration and action on adoption of ordinance number 2021-27 of the city of the city council the City of Coppers Cove, Texas, awarding the sale and authorizing the issuance of City of Coppers Cove, Texas Combination Tax and Revenue Certificates of Obligation Series 2021, levying and a tax and payment thereof, authorizing the execution and delivery of a paying agent registrar agreement, approving the official statement, finding the and determining that the meeting at which this ordinance is passed is open to the public as required by law and enacting other provisions relating thereto. Ariana Beckman, Director of Budget. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, City Council, City Manager. Uh, we have uh, discussed uh, debt issuance in a number of uh, meetings uh, during uh, June 1st meeting. Uh, City Council approved the resolution uh, to give notice of intent to issue certificates of obligation as uh, series 2021. Uh, several documents are attached to the agenda item in front of you. Uh, one of those items includes the detail uh, for all of the items that uh, will be funded uh, with the certificates of obligation. Uh, we have our financial advisor, Gary Kimball, with specialized public finance uh, on the phone that will go over the sale with you. Uh, we also have on the phone Glenn Opel with Park Racial. He's our uh, bond counsel. If you have any uh, questions uh, as far as uh, legal advice or guidance, uh, he's on the phone also uh, to have the fire. So uh, at this point, I'll let Gary, uh, Gary Kimball go over the details as well. Thank you, Ariana. Can everyone hear me all right? Keep talking, Gary. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, so with respect to the certificate of obligation issue, we were in the market today. Uh, we published notice at a prior council meeting for an, a not to exceed principal amount of 9.605 million. The final principal amount came in at $8.215 million, so we're well within the published limit. The target net proceeds of $9.46 approximately million was met, and the actual interest rate came in at 1.697% versus the budgeted rate of approximately 3.1%, so we're well below uh, where we budgeted to be on the interest rate for the certificates of obligation. That's primarily a function of, you know, having budgeted some cushion, but also um, seeing a fairly significant rally in interest rates over the last four weeks. Uh, we, we picked up almost 30 basis points uh, in just a few weeks' time, so we're very pleased with the timing on this. Uh, we we better exceeded all of our uh, budget targets for the certificates of obligation and I would uh, recommend for approval and be happy to answer any questions. Council, we have any questions? Appropriate for motion at this time? Yes, ma'am. 
entertain a motion. sale of obligations to be designated at City of Coppers Cove, Texas Combination Tax and Revenue Certificates of Obligation, Series 2021. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Campbell, a second by Mr. Yancey. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item two, consideration and action on ordinance number 2021-28 of the City of City Council of the City of Coppers Cove, Texas, authorizing the issuance and sale of City of Coppers Cove, Texas, general obligation refunding bonds, series 2021, levying a tax and payment thereof, authorizing the execution and delivery of documents and agreements in connection therewith, approving the preparation of an official statement, enacting their other provisions relating thereto, declaring an effective date and finding and determining that the meeting at which this ordinance is passed is open to the public as required by law. Ariana Beckman, Director of Budget. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, the agenda item before you uh, is a refunding of bonds that we have uh, previously issued. Uh, the purpose of uh, refunding is to refinance at a lower interest rate so we can generate interest savings. Again, our financial advisor, Gary Kimball, and our uh, bond council, Glenn Opel, please also with this. So at this time, again, I'll ask Gary Kimball to go over the refunding with you and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mariana. And so uh, once again, because of favorable interest rates in the market, uh, we were able to beat our budget expectation for the refinancing of two previously issued series of bonds by the city totaling $2.155 million. Uh, the interest rate on those previously issued bonds was just over three and a half percent. And we were able to lower that interest rate down to 1.7%. And the savings associated with that came in uh, just under $230,000 of net savings uh, to be realized over a 17 year period, approximately $14,000 a year with a net present value of just over $200,000. Uh, again, very pleased with this, would recommend it for approval and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Council, do we have any questions of Mr. Kimball? Question for Ryan and Dora Gary. Um, in here it says city reserves the right to include a total of 230 from series uh, 2013 PPFCO. These amounts, including estimated savings, are subject to market conditions as of July 20th. Are they included in, in this refunding? Yes. Uh, rates were low enough to make uh, that particular series economical to be included, and we did include it. Thank you. Any other questions? Not all. Hear a motion. Motion to council adopt ordinance 2021-28 authorizing the proposed issuance and sale of obligations to be designated as the City of Coppers Cove, Texas General Obligation Refunding Bonds Series 2021. Second. A motion by Mr. Yancey, a second by Mr. Chavez. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion Campbell. Motion Campbell. Motion. Thinking about you. <laughs> Motion passes. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Campbell. We Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Item three, consideration and action for council to provide direction on a funding source for the new animal control facility. Brian Wires, Deputy Chief of Police. Mayor and Council, um, I'm actually going to uh, start our discussion off uh, on this item. Um, at our previous meeting, uh, we discussed the animal control facility. Uh, council, council did provide consensus uh, with the, uh, at that time, proposed $3.8 million uh, project, including the Sally Port, correct, Mr. Barsh? Yes. Um, City Council also provided consensus that the location of that facility would be at 
the current fire station two uh, area. Um, and then uh, the last consensus item that council provided was that uh, we would in, uh, issue the debt to pay for uh, the construction of this facility as certificates of obligation. But council did request that there uh, be a uh, report provided on the cost difference to provide certificates of obligation versus general obligation bonds. So just to provide a, a quick explanation of the difference between the two, a general obligation bonds do require voter approval before issuing the debt. Certificates of obligation require notice to citizens that debt is going to be issued or the intent to issue that debt and uh, the citizens can file a petition to require an election to approve the issuance of that debt. So upon uh, receiving council's uh, consensus and direction, uh, Ms. Beckman uh, scheduled a meeting with uh, Mr. Opal um, and uh, we talked about what council's direction was and we asked a few questions and Mr. Opal provided uh, some research on the matter. Um, Current legis legislation that passed this year changes how certificates of obligation can be issued beginning September 1st of 2021. The use of certificates of obligation proceeds to construct a new facility for animal control is not an eligible use under certificates of obligation without the repayment of that debt coming from the general fund versus the debt service fund. That has a tax rate impact to the city in order to do that. So uh, in order to issue certificates of obligation, it would actually take revenue from the general fund and then require it to be paid uh, for the debt payments on that certificate of obligation in order to construct a new animal control facility. The other option is to um, hold a bond election and then issue GO bonds if that election passes. So uh, at this point, staff's recommendation is the only viable option in order to pay for an animal control facility is to issue general obligation bonds, which would require a special bond election. Uh, Mr. Opal is on the line with us if you have any specific questions of that. Um, but uh, council's direction to issue certificates of obligation is no longer a viable option and would require a bond election. So staff is needing new guidance from council uh, to essentially change from the issuance of certificates of obligation to a bond election. Um, I did have a discussion and we, we asked uh, Mr. Opal, do we have time to put it on the November election as a general obligation bond. His response is yes. Um, one, it's one, it's a simple uh, bond election because it's only one item that would be on that bond election. Um, and so he would be able to assist us in getting it on uh, the November election. Council would have to take action uh, in August, early August, in order to get it on that November election. So does council have questions? And again, uh, Ms. Beckman and Mr. Opal are on the line and DC Wires is here to answer any questions you may have and we're ready for your direction. Council, questions? Direction. Madam Mayor. Mr. Smith. I would like to make a motion that we recommend the city staff to proceed with preparing a bond election for the November ballot for the animal control facility. I have a motion by Mr. Smith and a second by Ms. Campbell. Any discussion? Madam Mayor. Yes. We're looking at running this as a certificate, I mean as a uh, general obligation and a vote on a facility that's going to cost Three point eight million. One of the things that was initially talked about and hasn't been fleshed out at this particular point in time is, if I'm not mistaken, that that Fort Hood is wanting to work with Coppers Cove on potentially partnering 
with an animal control facility because they can't or they're restricted from doing certain things if I'm not mistaken is that right uh, that is correct they they asked us um, Fort Hood requested the city provide a uh, proposal uh, to um, essentially take uh, the animals that they cannot keep beyond uh, is it um, 73 days or something 72 hours, 72 hours. Yeah. Beyond 72 hours, um, and then they would fall under whatever our policies are and requirements are uh, for animals within our shelter. Uh, we have provided that initial proposal uh, to Fort Hood. Uh, I think we received an initial response from them uh, yesterday, um, but I have not evaluated that fully, nor have I res we responded to that yet. Is If we partner with them, I, I'm going to assume that we're talking about uh, that Fort Hood supplies some resources, money-wise. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, they they recognize that they would have to pay for that service, um, up to and including um, capital investments, which would be facilities, vehicle, uh, as well as uh, human resources, um, additional positions, uh, and other operating costs. Well, if that's the case, I, I think we deserve to flesh that out a little bit more and see if we can tap into that resource because I, I, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the animals that we, that we take care of are ones that are left behind by soldiers leaving for one reason or another or, you know, other things. I'm not putting it on that, but I'm just saying that happens a lot uh, for all of the surrounding cities, surrounding Fort Hood. So if there is a potential extra funding source to partner with Fort Hood, uh, I think we're selling ourselves short if we look at putting this on the ballot right now and then depending on how that works out, if it passes or fails, if it fails, then it's, it's two year wait until it can be brought up again. Uh, I, I would like to see if we could flesh this out a little bit more and get some uh, really good answers, you know, when we're talking about money. And if there is something that is, that can be done, then, you know, I don't want to kick the can down the road. I think if we want to do this, then we would potentially call a special election in May for this one item. Can, if, can I respond to that real quick? Sure. I, I understand your concern on that. The, the one thing I want council to understand is the shelter I proposed was a shelter that's built to service the size of Copper's Cove. If we add on Fort Hood and take on that additional responsibility, don't expect me to come back with a $3.8 million price tag. Because you're, you're looking at a six to $8 million facility again. And you're right, we will have funding from Fort Hood, but that funding could be drawn out over several years. And then we go to the, we go to the city for a bond election, and we're going for an 8 or $9 million price tag. I, I just, I mean, it feels like I'm kicking the can again. Madam Mayor, isn't this easily expandable? It is. The it's built to is, expand. It's built to expand already. So I, I, I don't see anything wrong with getting it on the... November ballot right now, and it's easily expandable if we can, uh, and, and if Fort Hood wanted to use our animal shelter right now, they couldn't use it, or they oh, probably wouldn't want to use it. But if we have this one, then they may be more willing to partner with us and help us pay for the expansion to take care of, of their animals. I think, I think it, needs, it deserves a vote. And, and we're on a time crunch to get it on the ballot by November. We couldn't even invite, we couldn't even invite the their reason pets why over I here. Think that we're <laughs> rushing things. That's just my opinion. Well, I have been working on this since 2016. And, and I so understand. I, mean, <laughs> I totally understand, but, Brian. Yeah. But we're talking something new in here. It's not just us huddling yeah. about and, our facility. And I, I honestly, I, I like your idea for an expansion of the shelter. I just think it's kicking the can if we wait on it again and we're still sitting two, three years from now. I mean, even if, even if the bond election fails, then at least the citizens have spoken at that point. So. They, 
Mr. If Travis. it fails, but then it's another two years. Yes, sir. And that's that's the that's when things start getting the time frames get really uh, bad. I I would feel in my in my own estimation, I would feel that we're fairly comfortable with lower interest rates, low you know low interest rates through that you know first then second quarter of next year. Uh -huh. I will make a guess if it doesn't pass what it would be in two years. Hmm. And that interest cost is a great big factor there. So, I mean, there's arguments good and bad, but I, I, I think it deserves us looking at that partnership. Mr. Travis? A, a question uh, to Mr. Haverhill, or, or Deputy Chief Wires. The size of the uh, proposed or the, the discussion with Fort Hood about what their impact would be as far as bringing their operation here, what are we talking? How big are we talking? How many animals are we looking at? Did they give you any indication? I have those numbers, but I don't have those with me. Okay. Uh, Deputy Chief Albert is the one actually working on that contract with Fort Hood. Um, right now, I can tell you it's in its infancy. Um, and whether it would even be done by May to where there was an agreement with Fort Hood would be my other problem because I think, honestly, if, if, if I'm going to tell you how this would probably go, it, it, I'd be lucky to probably get it on the ballot by next November. So we're talking about interest rates and, and all that. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I've presented you all with everything you've asked for on this. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is another idea. But I guess my fear on this is, so when this one, if it does fail, what's the next new idea going to be? And then are we ever going to build the shelter? So that's, that's the position that I'm speaking from. If I'm not mistaken, let me ask you a question, Ryan. Pardon me. Yes, me. Uh, isn't Fort Hood on a time crunch? Aren't they on a time delay to do, I mean, a time frame to get this done? Yes, their their effort is the they're trying to accomplish this well before June of twenty twenty two, and so that's that's the effort they're trying to accomplish. And to answer uh, Mr. Chavez's question, based on um, information sent by Fort Hood, they take in approximately nine hundred animals per year. Well over a thousand. Madam Mayor, yes. I, I, I know I've already said it once, but I think if we get it well underway, then Fort Hood would certainly want to cooperate with us. I mean, if, if we can get it to the voters and the voters allow us to build the animal shelter, uh, then there will be a place for them to bring the animals. If what They can't bring them with what we currently have. And they'd be certainly, maybe they'd be cooperative in expanding or helping us expand the, the shelter at that time. I'm just curious uh, if Fort Hood is even able to make a commitment when it's not even been voted on by our uh, citizens, that they could commit to uh, the possibility of a shelter being built. How, how can they do that with a 2022 time crunch? You, do you understand what I'm saying? That How can um, they commit to something that's abstract? Right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just curious about that. Um, I, I don't know how that works, but... On that, honestly, they're they're paying for the service. They're not taking the facility into consideration. The problem we would have is if we got that contract right. and it, and then the shelter failed in May, then we wouldn't be able to accommodate that contract. Am, am I correct, Mr. Havel? Yeah, that, that is exactly correct. Yeah, and and we were upfront about that with mm -hmm. our situation with them. Mm -hmm. We told them this is what we're looking at, um, and they're the ones who actually said. Well, ask us for funding for a new shelter. So we did. Madam Mayor. Yes. Uh, the, the, the idea of the partnership with Fort Hood uh, intrigues me, although I've only heard about it today. Uh, however, De the deputy chief has very valid points of the efforts that he and his staff and the department has put forth in order to push this thing across the goal line. 
although I, I really want that partnership and I think it would be beneficial to both concerned, Mr. Smith has a point in that if we go for a vote now, at least we'll hear what the people have to say. Now, granted, if we go down in flames, it's two more years, but it's not because of bureaucratic delay or, or any nonsense like that. It's because the people have spoken. But we're, we're talking about, but we're talking about that also. We're talking about an election. Yeah. Not necessarily in November. We are talking about an election in May as well. So Madam that's, Mayor, it's not. That's true. You're, you are correct. It's also possible that if it gets voted down by the citizens, Fort Hood may step up and say, we'll build it for you. I mean, we don't know what they're going to do. If they said, let's give us some money, we're still waiting for, uh, how do you call that, recycling. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I don't think Fort Hood's going to say, we'll build it for you if the citizens say no. Well, uh, they said, how about funding? So maybe they, they could come up with the funding. I just think we're missing out on an opportunity to to get a partnership with Fort Hood. Well, and if we put it on a November election and it fails, then we've missed out. Mayor Diaz. Yes. Um, Glenn Opor, our uh, bond council, uh, has actually uh, raised his hand, and so um, if you would allow him to to sure. provide some insight. Mr. Opal. Th thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Glenn Opal with Bracewell, the, the city's bond council. Just wanted to <clears throat> bring up two quick points. I think we were talking about August as the time frame for calling the election. I want to kind of clarify that. The deadline is August 16th. I think under your meeting schedule, that would force you and push you into having to uh, get this voted on at your August 3rd meeting, right? It's first and it's a first and third Tuesdays. Is that right? Uh, Glenn, this is Ryan Haverlaw. So that that's accurate, but we do have a special meeting planned for August 10th okay. for budgetary okay. action where this action could be taken as well. Okay, and just uh, as, as another, uh, just something to note, I, I don't want to speak to it at this point because we don't know the nature of it. The nature of the federal government's involvement in the center could affect uh, 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 Mr. Havala, the, uh, the our ability to issue the bonds on a tax exempt basis. E easier, easier for them to participate in a capital contribution because they would just be funding part of the facility. If they become a revenue provider that pays some portion of the debt service that has the potential to rise to the level of what we would consider under the tax code, a federal guarantee, which could, and is also private use, could have um, a private payment, excuse me, could have an impact uh, on the tax tax analysis for tax exempt bonds. Not something, I mean, it, just something to make sure you keep in mind as we talk about their uh, their participation. Thank you, Mr. Hopel. We do have a motion and a second on the floor. I'll turn my mic on now. We do have a motion and a second on the table. So if we're going to continue to discuss we need to act on the motion. Mr. Spaghetti. Turn your mic on. Mr. I'm waiting to vote. Oh, you're waiting to vote. I don't know. I can withdraw my motion and wait until August to after we have more time to discuss this. I don't want to go past the August deadline though. Okay. Mayor. Yes. So in, in order uh, for staff to work uh, with Mr. Opal and preparing the necessary documentation, um, I'm, I'm actually looking for council's direction tonight. Uh, if we wait till August 3rd, I think we are uh, pushing that timeline too uh, close to the deadline in order to accomplish that. Um, and with the, the many state law changes that have occurred over the last few years, we wanna make sure we do this right. Madam Mayor. Um, would you mind coming up and talking to me? Yes. I am sorry. <laughs> no, she's like, me? Do you mind just, I would really like to hear what you have to say, because you're there, and I want to hear, if you don't mind, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
What question do you have for me, ma'am? Well, I just want to hear. So, Mayor, this is uh, Tamara Hall with uh, Animal Control. I'm a supervisor for Copper's Cove Animal Control. Thank you. Can you tell me what are your thoughts and what we're discussing today? I'm sure you have an opinion on all of this, and I'm just very interested in hearing from you. And it's just a general, it's just. I know we've had multiple issues out there at the shelter with regards to some of the infrastructure. Infrastructure. Thank you. Um, we've had to have Cove Plumbing come out three times, I believe it is, within the last eight weeks with regards to some of the plumbing issues where uh, the oldest kennel, which is Kennel B, which is our intake facility, that has continuously backed up. And we're doing everything we can to fix it. We're, we're taking extra precautions. But there's some things that we cannot eliminate. And then we also have the situation with our intake of cats. Now, as the city may know, residents may not know, we have 12 cat cages for the entire city of Copper's Cove. And as we all know, there is a very, very large population of cats. In last month alone, we had 120 cats and kittens come in. Now, we're doing the best we can, but that is way over the limit. And we can only handle so much. Rescues can only handle so much. Fosters can only handle so much. We're doing everything we can to get them adopted out and get them out of the, sh and get them out of the shelter but sometimes it's not always that easy. Um, with our adoptable dogs, we are getting calls on a daily basis. And a lot of them are from people outside of the city of Copper's Cove wanting to surrender their pets. Uh, usually it's dogs that uh, people are wanting to surrender for any given reason. Um, a person's life has changed to the effect that they can no longer care for that animal or just for any given reason. Or in some cases, yes, it is the soldiers that are calling us up and wanting to surrender their pets because they're being transferred overseas or they're being transferred elsewhere or their, their family dynamics have changed. We are turning them down. That is a revenue source that we are losing out on because we don't have the space available to take in these pets that would give them a better opportunity. I understand that not every pet is going to work out with a specific family. Sometimes there's just a dynamic that is just not met on both the pet and the person, the family's part. But that does not disqualify that animal as being unadoptable or unwanted or a throwaway pet, okay? And that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to help these animals. We're also trying to help the community. We're also trying to help the surrounding communities by giving them an opportunity to provide an animal with a new home and increase the family's joy. Like I said, it may not work out for one family, but that doesn't mean it's gonna work out for another family. Just to expand on that, that was Thank the, you. The, that was the touching part of it. That the, the biggest part that we're trying to accomplish that accomplishes everything that she mentioned is providing the city with a facility that allows us to accomplish things like that. Uh, but right now, the facility that they are working in is being held together with band aids. When she talked about Cove Plumbing, that's just one of many problems. They've got rat infestations. They fail state state uh, uh, not exams, state uh, inspections. Um, and with this facility, we, we can't pass that. We can't make that happen. And so we don't come to you just asking, hey, we need a new building. We're telling you that we need something, and it keeps getting pushed off. And, and yeah, there is, there is a little frustration involved in it when you're on this side of it asking for something and doing everything the council asks to make it acceptable and then getting it kicked down the road again. So the Fort Hood thing is a great, it's a great idea. And if it happens, it, it might be the best thing in the world for us. But there's no guarantee to it. And for the last five years I've been working on this project, there's never been a guarantee to it. 
And it's just, it, it's frightening to me to kick the can down the road again and just hope that, that Fort Hood's gonna, gonna pitch in or that they're gonna do what we need them to do financially to support the shelter. So my thing is let the citizens, if, if it's what they want, let them, let them vote for it. And if they don't want it, then we'll keep putting Band-Aids on stuff until we have a chance to come back again. And I am speaking from the perspective of the person that's been trying to work on this for six years. So, um, you know, that's, take that into consideration, too. I want you all to make the best decision for the city, but I want you to do it with all the information I can possibly provide you. I, I want you to know that we are trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I personally am trying to do that with the best, in the best way possible for for the animal control facility and for the citizens of Copper's Cove. And I saw Fort Hood as an opportunity to partner mm -hmm. in that. Um, and and I, I actually still think that is a good opportunity. Um, so, but, but we need to do something. Don't misunderstand, I know we need to do something at all. But if we have the opportunity to have a, <clears throat> a extra revenue source on something that we know is going to cost a lot of money to begin with, um, uh, it pays us, it, it, in, in my estimation, it's in the best interest to explore that. And then uh, if it blows up, then we could still put it on, we still put it as a special election on the May ballot for for this just as it is. If we find out that there could be a partnership and, and it's of a substantial nature, then we're, we're big winners. So again, we do have a motion on the table to call for the election in November. We have a second. Are we ready for a vote? We're ready to second. Yeah, Diane, second. So we're ready to vote. I'm gonna go ahead and roll call vote. Joanne Cortland? Aye. Fred Chavez? Aye. Sorry. Dan Yancey? Nay. Diane Campbell? Jack Smith? Aye. Four to two. Motion carries. Thanks. Item four. Presentation by the Hill Country Community Action Association on the Meals on Wheels program and related expenses for fiscal year 2019-2020 and consideration and action to authorize payment for eligible expenses. Kimber Hobbs, Aging Services Director. Thank you for having me. My name is Ashley Johnson. Kimber was unable to make it, so I'm filling in for her. Um, I won't take up much of your time. This is uh, regarding Hill Country Community Actions, uh, Copper's Cove Meals and Wheels Program. Uh, we provide a nutritious noon meal, noon meal to senior citizens five days per week. The target population is elderly, persons over 60, and also persons with disabilities. Um, this is more than just a meal, it's nutrition education, it's a safety and wellness check, friendly visit, companionship, sense of security. Some of these people, this is the only person that they see in a day. Um, so it's, it's not just a meal. Um, these are the different revenue streams that we have had for this particular location for uh, 10 119 through 930 um, of tw 20. Uh, $66,451. Previously, Kimbra had um, approached for the normal annual $5,000 that we request every year. Uh, at that point in time, we had an excess deficit of um, $2,396. Uh, when COVID hit, we expanded from seven to 8,000 meals a year to 11,000 meals a year. So we had increased expenses serving more people um, that were at home during during those few months um, in the budget for COVID. 
So the request is for the excess deficit of $23.96. Our uh, current participant contribution, the suggested contribution is $3. Um, during this time period, we didn't have any participant contributions. We never turn anyone away due to their inability to pay. Uh, it's not a requirement to receive a meal. Um, we served 11,192 meals in Copper's Cove during this time period, improving the health and well-being of senior citizens by, by providing nutritious meals and trying to keep our most vulnerable population safe and, safe and healthy is the goal. Are there any questions? Council, we have any questions? Appears to be none. I'll hear a motion. <coughs> Madam Mayor. Yes. Make a motion, City Council. Uh, approve the appropriate eligible reimbursement amount up to $2,396 and authorized payment to HCCAA. Second. 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 I have a motion by Mr. Yancey, a second by Mr. Smith. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Item five, consideration and action on two appointments to the Planning and Zoning Commission to fill positions one and two, and one appointment to the Board of Adjustments to fill position one. Bobby Lewis, Development Services Director. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Bobby Lewis, Development Services Director. On June 30th, 2021, the term of office for Planning and Zoning Commissioner Vice Chairman Robert Enter in position one, and for Commissioner Kenneth Thomas in position two, expired after six years of service on the commission. On June 30th, 2021, the term of office for Board of Adjustment member Jerry Prince Cantel in position one expired after two years of service on the board. In an effort to obtain qualified applicants, vacancy announcements were released to the media on May 27, 2021, with the submittal deadline of July 6, 2021. The following candidate applicants are attached for consideration. David Morris, Paul Williams, Tamara Gass. Staff recommend City Council review the application submitted for appointments to the Planning and Zoning Commission and to the Board of Adjustment. Thank you, sir. nominate David Morris to P and Z. Second. Okay, wait. So we have P and Z and Board of Adjustments. Yes, correct. Three applicants and three positions. So do we need to open it up for nominations first? Oh. Yes. Or Based on our ordinance, that's the process. Okay. Madam Mayor. So, just a moment, sir. <laughs> Let me get my wits about me. <laughs> so I have a nomination for D David Morris for PNZ. Thank you. Any other nominations? Madam Mayor, yes, I'd sir. like to nominate, nominate Tamara Gass for PNZ. Have a nomination, Tamara Gass, PNZ. Any other nominations? Madam Mayor? Yes. I'd like to nominate Paul Williams for PNZ. Oh, PNZ. I'm so sorry. For PNZ. Paul Williams for PNZ? Yes. Any other nominations? Well, I guess there's none because that's all three of them. We need our sort. Do we, sorry, Madam Mayor, do we need to uh, make a nomination for Board of Adjustments? Let's do them one at a time. Okay. Since all three of them are nominated for the first one. Okay, the, the first name that comes up is Tamara Gast. Entertain a motion on Ms. Gast. Madam Mayor. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we appoint Tamara Gast to PNZ. Second. I have a motion.
motion by Mr. Smith, a second by Ms. Cortland. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The second name chosen is Paul Williams. Entertain a motion on Mr. Williams. Madam Mayor, I make a motion to nominate, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm so sorry. Um, to nominate Paul Williams to PNC. To actually place him on. Place him, thank you. Place him on PNC. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by Ms. Hart, second by Mr. Chavez. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Or two to P and Z. Correct? Correct. So now I have entertained motions for Board of Adjustments. Madam Mayor, I'd like to nominate David Morris to uh, sit on the Board of Adjustments. Second. You don't need seconds on motions or nominations. Any other nominations for Board of Adjustments? I have no other nominations. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Yes. I move that uh, we put place David Morris on the Board of Adjustments. By acclamation. By acclamation. Thank you. Second. Second. Or second. That sounded like I seconded. I have a motion by Mr. Chavez, a second by Ms. Cortland. Any discussion? Yes. I'm going to get corrected. Mayor, um, I, I just want to point out um, that Mr. Morris uh, did not uh, add uh, Board of Adjustments onto his application, so that would have, be something that we would have to ask him if he's even willing to participate. Um, Mr. Morris and uh, Mr. Williams uh, only put planning and zoning on their application, um, and uh, Ms. Gast uh, was the only applicant uh, that put both uh, planning and zoning and board of adjustments um, and so with the motion that council is about to take action on um, there would have to be additional discussions within mr morris to see if he would even be willing to participate on board of adjustments at this point okay so contingent to mr morris agreeing to be on board of adjustments I'll go ahead and all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Move on to item six, consideration and action to approve resolution number 2021-20, allowing the city manager to conduct actions necessary to apply for, accept, reject, alter, terminate, submit, progress reports and close an application for the American Rescue Plan Act coronavirus local fiscal recovery funds from the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Ryan Haberlaw, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, the city was notified um, by the U.S. Treasury that uh, we had received an allocation. Um, and the discussion I've had with Council in the past is uh, that that number uh, was just over $7 million. Um, the fact that we have a population under 50,000 made us a non-entitlement city, which means that allocation was going to go to the state and then be allocated from the state to uh, the city of Copper's Cove. Uh, the state of Texas uh, did not immediately request those funds. Um, and uh, so it's actually been months since we had have had any type of discussion on this uh, in the last uh, 20 days, uh, the uh, state of Texas has notified uh, local governments that they are going to request those funds. They have identified that the Texas Department of Emergency Management is the agency that will uh, oversee the allocation and disbursement of those funds. Interestingly enough, though, all, all uh, activities uh, performed under or with these funds must be reported to the Treasury not to the Texas Department of Emergency Management. 
And so um, this will be uh, something new for local governments uh, that are receiving funds from the state but reporting directly to the federal, federal government as far as activities are concerned. Um, in order to be eligible and to receive these funds, uh, the city must take action by August 2nd uh, to submit proper documentation re- uh, notifying the state that we do want to participate um, in the uh, Corona Local, uh, uh, and I forgot the name of it already, Corona Local Fiscal Recovery Funds uh, Program, uh, which is uh, funded through uh, the ARPA. And uh, that documentation is not an application. It's simply a notice that says, we want to participate. We will abide by the guidelines that are established for uh, the CLFRF funds. Um, And then we will receive our first installment payment to the city, which is uh, 50% of the uh, current allocation of $8,235,166.01. Um, There are a number of eligible uses uh, for these funds. Uh, Those are specifically provided in uh, your background memo, uh, but it will require that staff uh, bring options of how to utilize those funds and uh, receive direction and action from council on the use of those funds. So with that, staff's uh, request is that city council take action to approve uh, resolution 2021-20, uh, which allows me to uh, submit uh, the necessary documentation to uh, receive uh, the CLFRF funds. Council, we have any questions of Mr. Haverlaw? I'll hear a motion. Madam Mayor. Yes. Make a motion, Council approve resolution 21 2021-20 2021-20 for submission of a request for the American Rescue Plan Act Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Funds in an amount not to exceed $8,235,166.01. Second. A motion by Mr. Yancey, a second by Ms. Cortland. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item seven, consideration and action on authorizing the city manager, manager to execute a professional services agreement with Lockwood Andrews and Newman Inc. for the design and construction phases services for the South Wastewater Treatment Plant Ultraviolet Disinfection Systems Upgrade Project included in the city's capital improvement projects for FY 2020. Scott Osborne, Public Works Director. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, City Council. Item before you tonight is entering into or a proposal to enter into a professional services agreement with LAN uh, for design and construction phase services for the South Wastewater Treatment uh, Plant Ultraviolet Disinfection System, a great project. That's a mouthful. Um, The existing uh, UV technology was originally installed back in 1995-96 with the plant upgrade. Uh, So we're going on uh, about 25 years post-expansion. At this point, the UV system that is in place is in various states of operation. Uh, Most of the parts that uh, go into this system are obsolete, no longer able to replace those parts. Um, so it's still dis- disinfecting within the city's guidelines under its TCEQ permit. However, it is an age system. So as part of the 2020 capital improvement plan, this project was programmed into um, funding and funded. Tonight, we're looking for your authorization to move forward with a contract with LAN in the amount of 148100 once again, for the project management, design, bidding, construction management, and surveying associated with this project. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, sir. Council, we have any questions of Mr. Osborne? If not, I'll hear a motion. Yes. Okay. Uh, I move that the City Council authorize the City Manager to enter into the professional service agreement with Lockwood, Andrews, and Newman, 
Inc. land for the scope of services and the amount not to exceed $148,100. Second. A motion by Ms. Campbell, a second by Mr. Chavez. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you very sir. much. Item 8, consideration and action on approving a standard governmental contract and purchasing rider of the City of Coppers Cobra and Harrelaw City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, we work with our city attorney regularly to review contracts uh, with vendors. Uh, our city attorney has taken uh, the steps to standardize a number of our agreements, uh, such as our standard professional um, service agreement, which uh, the council just took action on for a specific project. Um, we have a standard purchasing uh, agreement as well. Uh, recently, uh, we have uh, requested uh, Mr. Zek and his team to review a number of contracts uh, that come from vendors, um, generally because they are uh, smaller contracts, but we still need those reviewed by the city attorney. Uh, in order to help standardize and create some efficiencies so that every contract we're not having to necessarily send to the city attorney, um, Mr. Zek has created this rider uh, that is attached and it will simply allow us to take that rider, attach it to a vendor's agreement um, and let the vendor know that we'll sign the agreement uh, when you agree to have this rider attached to the agreement, which sets out all of the uh, necessary standard language uh, for that um, service or that product purchase. Uh, so with that, um, staff's recommendation is just uh, to authorize uh, the use of that standard governmental contract and purchasing rider, uh, which will help create efficiencies with uh, the coordination with the city attorney. Thank you, sir. Any questions of Mr. Havilaw? Hearing none, I'll hear a motion. Madam Mayor, Fred Chavez. Uh, I move that the City Council approve the standard governmental contract and purchasing rider of the City of Coppers Cove. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Chavez, a second by Ms. Cortland. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 9, consideration and action authorizing council members to travel to the Texas Mil Municipal League. 2021 Annual Conference and the National Training Center, Ryan Haverlaw, City Manager. Thank you again, Mayor. Mayor and Council, uh, we, we bring this item to you each year. Uh, the Texas Municipal League holds an annual conference. At that annual conference, um, uh, city staff as well as elected officials uh, from numerous cities uh, attend and uh, learn uh, about uh, better governance uh, for uh, their localities. Um, Many of the council members that are up here have actually attended this conference uh, and have reported to me that they have found it very valuable. Um, I have attended this conference a couple of times. I also find it valuable. I do think it would be a value to uh, council members uh, to consider attending. Uh, council has passed an ordinance. It's ordinance 2019-35, which details uh, when council members are eligible to attend uh, training based on the time frame in which that training is occurring and in which the council member is within a specific term or uh, re-election. And so um, what basically what that says is in the last 120 days, if a council member is in their final term or they are going to run for re-election, they are not eligible to travel. And so uh, with that, um, the first part of this agenda item is really just to uh, receive um, action on uh, who wants to attend the TML annual conference, which is being held October 6th through the 9th, um, and uh, action by the council to authorize those council members to attend the annual conference. Takers down here. TML. Oh. Ms. Campbell. So Ms. Campbell, Ms. Hart, and Mr. Smith. <laughs> so Mayor, with that, there'd need to be an action that authorized uh, those council members to attend TML. Council. Madam Mayor. Yes. 
I move that we uh, send to TML uh, Councilman Hart, Campbell, and Smith to represent our city and to learn many new things. We have a second. Second. Uh, motion by Mr. Chavez, second by Ms. Court. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor. The last part of this is a uh, National Training Center. Um, the uh, last National Training Center uh, event occurred in 2019, in the spring of 2019. Um, in the late spring, uh, the city received uh, invitations, and this is by an invitation only uh, activity. Um, invitations by uh, were received uh, for myself as well as Mayor Diaz to attend uh, the National Training Center in November of 2019 or April of 2020. Um, City Council authorized uh, that travel on August 20 of 2019 um, and then uh, the city began coordinating uh, attendance to NTC for uh, both of us uh, and uh, made the necessary payments um, to attend NTC. Shortly uh, before uh, traveling uh, to NTC in November of 2019, uh, that trip was canceled as a result of the um, uh, new situation called COVID-19 at that time. Uh, shortly after um, December, uh, the April 2020 event was also canceled and no events have been scheduled uh, since that time. Um, the uh, uh, Mayor Diaz, as, as well as myself, have uh, again received a notification uh, that NTC is uh, being held and uh, our invitation is, uh, uh, has not expired and is still um, out there. However, um, the ordinance that we have states that uh, authorization for travel uh, will not be granted in the last 120 days of uh, an elected official's final term. Uh, Mayor Diaz has uh, provided notice that uh, she is not running for re-election. Um, and this, so essentially this is her final term and she will be in the last 20 days, 120 days um, of her term. Uh, there is uh, a slight nuance here where um, city council has already provided authorization for her to travel and payment has been made uh, for this travel. Again, it will be, the travel will occur within the last 120 days um, of uh, Mayor Diaz's term. Uh, this is a by invitation only event, and so we cannot substitute somebody else in order uh, to attend that event in her stead uh, if council uh, doesn't agree that um, her attendance to NTC uh, is still authorized. Mayor Diaz, if you have any comments. At first, when I realized this, I, I, because of the ordinance, I did not think it was appropriate that I attend um, because I was in my 120 days um, and, and still really do not feel comfortable and think it's appropriate that I attend. The only caveat is, is that it's already paid for. So I'm, I'm not advocating either way. Um, I, I do think it's appropriate that um, I, I don't go if that's the desire of the council just because it is the last um, 120 days in my term and I don't think it's appropriate that I travel on the city's dime, but it's, our, it's a, a dime that's already been spent. Madam Mayor Fred Chavez, if I may. Sure. Uh, I think the, the fact that uh, we've already spent the money and that we will lose that position and nobody will go in attendance is it would be a waste of money. I think far beyond uh, rules and regulations is something we've been trying to do on this council, which is to establish uh, strong ties and relationships with Fort Hood. Uh, and there's a thing in our community which is continuity of government. I think it's important that you go representing our city because you still will be the mayor. You will still be carrying our banner and our message and our wants and desires and you can communicate that and then bring back also from NTC your experience and your advice and counsel. There's value in you going. There is no value in leaving a blank hole where 
you you would have been. So I'm 100 percent in favor of you going. If that's if that needs to be a motion, then so moved. Second. Second. <laughs> have a motion by Mr. Chavez and a second by Ms. Campbell. Any discussion? Do we need to vote on you, Ryan, as well? Um, council certainly can, by all means. Uh, the, just kind of a done deal. Yeah, my, it was already voted on. The, the, the only difference between uh, my, <laughs> my authorization is um, uh, I'm not the elected official that uh, has, this, has the restriction gotcha. in the ordinance. Any discussion? Madam Mayor, yes. I, I mean, the fact that this was in, within this last 120 days, notwithstanding, this was approved in 2019 in circumstances far, way beyond your or anybody else's control negated the opportunity to attend NTC. I have attended that and the information uh, and the uh, working knowledge of how our soldiers train is invaluable. Uh, just because you're not uh, running for re-election as mayor doesn't mean you get to ride off into the sunset. And so uh, uh, I think that you're going to be continue to be a valuable member of the Copper Cove community, working with council, board of officials, and for that reason, I wholeheartedly think you should go. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I appreciate each one of you. We have already heard our reports from staff outside entities and advisory committees, so we'll move on to items for future agendas. Ms. Cortland. Items for future agenda? None, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Chavez. I have nothing, ma'am. Ms. Giancy. Nothing. None. Ms. Hart, Mr. Smith. None. No items or future agenda. We'll move on to executive session. Item one, pursuant to section 551.072 of the Open Meetings Act, Texas, uh, Act, Texas Government Code, the City Council will meet in executive session to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property located at 401 North Main Street. The time is 814. Council will adjourn into executive session.
Time is 8.23. Council is reconvened into open session from executive session. There was no action that's required from executive session. So again, the time is 8.23. I'll adjourn this meeting. <laughs>